Okay, we're back. And before we move into our agenda, we just have a question, Ms. Knight. Um, the committees that we just changed, there's a CPC meeting Wednesday and there's an SDAB meeting tomorrow night. Did the, the changes take place? Effective today. All appointments for council are from org meeting to org meeting. So from the last October meeting till today. So we shuffle. <laughs> okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So, uh, Councillor Nagel, if you can't make Wednesday, maybe Councillor Wilson can just carry on for one more meeting. Yeah. Okay. No? Unfortunately, there is um, regulations that, that restrict someone from CPC sitting on SDAB and vice versa because one makes decisions for right. the other. Um, so, we will have to be without for the upcoming meetings. So, no. It's official right now. If you can't make Wednesday, you can't make Wednesday. That's why we have alternates. All right. Okay. That's clear. So we'll call the meeting to order. Uh, moving into the agenda, we need to add an in-camera item. And I would like to move, and it's not me personally, it is just pro process and policy, uh, 6A ahead of 5A so that we can uh, talk about the neighborhood plan for Fireside prior to the land use discussion. So if nobody has anything else to add, if we could get a motion to adopt the agenda as amended. I do. In camera item and the change. Councilor Reed. I also move the agenda as amended. All those in favor. Carried, thank you. Uh, minutes from our previous meeting. Has anybody had a chance to read those and uh, would like to move them? Councilor Badeco, all those in favor? Carried, those were great minutes, thank you. Uh, delegations, Ms. Lowe. Good evening, Mayor and Council. This evening, Janine Rosler, Acting Executive Director, and Carla Bennett, Operations Manager, are in attendance to provide their annual presentation, giving Council insight into the Humane Society's activities for the year. I'll ask them to come to the thank meeting. you. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and members of Council. Um, thank you for the opportunity to provide an overview of uh, the Humane Society's programs and services this evening um, that we offer the Cochrane residents and our community, as well as some of the highlights from 2018. Uh, my name is Janine Rossler. I'm the Acting Executive Director, and with me is Carla Bennett, our Operations Manager. To start, I'd like to share a bit about who we are and uh, the direction we strive to go. So our mission really captures the purpose of our organization and the key activities that we are constantly engaged in. Uh, shelter, sheltering, rehabilitation, training for pets, and supporting people in our community. Along with our mission and vision, we created core values, and these values describe us and what is important to us, and they help guide us ethically in our decision making. We have always enjoyed a family-like atmosphere from a grassroots start to today, and we knew this was something that makes us, uh, we knew this was something that makes us us, um, and we didn't want to lose that um, as we grow and develop, so we wanted to make sure we captured this as a culture statement for our organization. Hmm. So last year, 2018, marked 20 years um, for the Cochrane Area Humane Society, and we've grown to where we are now, um, have the equivalent of 16 full-time employees, over 600 volunteers. We operate an 8,000-square-foot 8, shelter in addition to a 4,000 square foot re rehabilitation and education center, as well as a fully operational uh, hospital. We cannot continue to operate without the help of our volunteers. Uh, our volunteers um, expand our capacity through foster care and provide exceptional care to our residents, whether it's at the shelter or in their own homes. 
to help with the um, organization better manage resources, limit euthanasia, focus services, and not infringe on other humane societies, the Cochrane Area Humane Society defined a service area through strategic planning process about five years ago, and these are the areas that we serve. 2018 statistics saw our busiest year yet, with a total animal uh, count of 1,893 animals, um, with 1,513 being adopted in that year. So with only a small portion of our um, funding coming from grants, um, the fundraising that we do certainly keeps our doors open. And we have incredible support from our donors who contribute close to 40% of our funds annually. However, we are continually growing our programs and services um, and offer fundraising events in an effort to become as self-sustainable as possible. Our operating budget in 2018 was just over 1.2 million, and therefore increasing self-help um, sources is critical for us. Just to capture some of the events from 2018, um, some of our fundraising initiatives, uh, Gala and the Mutstrad in 2018 were our largest fundraisers, and then everything down to smaller in-house fundraisers such as uh, book sales in the spring and fall, and quarterly pedicures where people can come in and uh, for a donation have their pet's nails trimmed. As you can see, these um, events do raise quite a bit for us. $80,000 was, was raised through those types of events in 2018, and they go straight into the operations. And then to share with you um, some of the community events we were involved in, they just help us create awareness, um, and they're a super fun way to engage the community as well. So everything from the trade show and the Labor Day Parade, outhouse races are a lot of fun. And then we do have um, some folks doing third-party fundraisers for us as well. An amazing way to raise funds for the shelter, Hair of the Dog was an example of an event as such. This uh, was a award we are very proud to receive. Um, it really feels great to be valued and recognized by the Cochrane community. It's certainly something we wouldn't have been able to achieve without the amazing, um, a great team of board of directors and our staff, volunteers, and we want to thank all to those that uh, voted for us. A new self-help initiative for us over the past couple years is offering public seminars. We have the space now in our or Rehabilitation Education Center to be able to host larger functions. This year, for example, we did an industry seminar um, inviting Karen, uh, Dr. Karen Overall. We had about 125 attendees, and it raised over $30,000 for the shelter. It's me. We'll now take this opportunity to take a little uh, look at our programs and services. Uh, um, so sheltering and more. Every pet that enters the shelter is provided with food, water, shelter, vaccinations, veterinary care, affection, and grooming if needed. We use the five freedoms as a foundation for our care. Animals are checked for identification, tattoos and microchips on intake, and every effort is made to contact owners where possible. The Cochrane Area Humane Society Lost and Found program provides the care needed to keep pets safe and comfortable until they are reunited with their owners. Our adoption counselors do their best to ensure that all of our residents are placed in loving homes. Uh, we adopted out 1,514 animals in uh, 2018, and 389 of those animals went into Cochrane families. All of our animals are given an intake exam on arrival to assess their health and behavior. They are then monitored by staff and volunteers while they wait for surgery and or their move to adoption. Following their assessment, some pets require rehabilitation programs prior to being placed for adoption, and these programs can include both behavior modification and medical rehabilitation. An example of our a re rehabilitation program is Play for Life. Dogs in a shelter environment are surrounded by other dogs 24-7. The Play for Life is a program designed to give shelter canines an opportunity to socialize with other dogs in play providing an opportunity for dogs to ditch the leash and interact freely with other dogs, which can reduce their stress and provide enrichment. That can only be found by interacting with their own species. 
Not only does Play for Life have enormous benefits for the dogs through stress reduction and socialization, it can also help increase the adoptability and pro provide valuable information to our staff. The Cochranary Humane Society is very proud of our unique Hiking with Hounds volunteer program. Every second Monday, a group of volunteers head out with dogs and take them hiking, snowshoeing, kayaking, paddle boarding uh, through the main, uh, many great trails around our area. It's a very welcome treat for our dogs and it's an enriching for volunteers as it is for the dogs. It builds community within our volunteer group and by presenting the dogs in a different light, we are able to show potential adopters the benefits of adopting a dog from a shelter and how they might fit in with their family. Uh, our Positive Approach Canine Education Program provides participants with a solid education in dog behavior and the opportunity to build their skills with our dogs. It has the added benefit of providing shelter dogs with the opportunity for behavioral rehabilitation and thereby making them more adoptable. We offer a complete range of training services including private and semi-private classes, behavior consults and a full range of obedience and agility classes as well as specialized classes for reactive and fearful dogs. Our instructors are highly trained in positive reinforcement training and are certified professional dog trainers. Uh, another avenue for raising um, or generating funds for the shelter is our um, full service grooming salon and also a self serve dog wash. They opened as part of our uh, Rehabilitation Education Center in 2017 and combined they bring in just under $30,000 for the organization. Norm's Nook is our pet supply store that has been open as long as the shelter's been open. Again, um, providing a full range of training and pet enrichment items. Also gen revenue generating for us uh, approximately $26,000 a year. So going into humane education, education is really at the core of all we do and it is so important for us um, that we engage children and youth really as early as possible. We strive to get them passionate about animals and their welfare um, while teaching them empathy and growing their circles of compassion to include not only animals but for people as well. We do this through various humane education um, programs such as our Humane Helpers, which is a sort of a teen opportunity when between the ages of 13 and 15 when they're not quite old enough to volunteer on their own but maybe a little bit too old and old for summer camp um, they can come in and volunteer with a parent or an adult we also offer scholarship programs to grade through 12 students who are pursuing careers in human or animal health care or medicine in education um, and we're very proud to be able to present scholarships to these students last year two thousand dollars two one thousand dollar scholarships and one two thousand dollar scholarships were awarded to very deserving students we also like to recognize um, students in classrooms for going above and beyond maybe creating awareness or doing some fundraising for us and so we elect a, a classroom to receive our humane classroom of the year award some other Avenues for us to engage children is through school visits and shelter tours. We offer summer camps throughout the year, birthday parties, pajama parties, critter club where kids get hands-on time with the animals while learning certain um, advocacy skills and um, other areas of, of animal welfare. Over 1,000 children participated in humane education programming with us in 2018. Our Rural Rescue and Support Program is a program that excuse me, provides support to other rural rescue organizations and the communities that they serve with their animal numbers and with medical and behavior cases. This program is in line with our vision to be a re regional leader in inspiring communities to value and treat animals with respect while participating in initiatives that reduce indifference towards suffering of and pop overpopulation of animals. There's a very important program or two programs really for us, our pet safekeeping and emergency boarding programs. These programs provide victims of uh, family violence and individuals and families experiencing personal tragedy or crisis with free temporary care and safe housing of their pets while they seek the help that they need. We have helped almost 70 animals since these programs were implemented in 2011. 
this year we helped four families from Co uh, in 2018 we helped four families in Cochrane that were in need I want to share some upcoming events with you and, and encourage everyone to join us. Our biggest fundraiser of the year is our gala coming up on November 16th. And then we invite everyone to our Christmas open house on December 14th. And one special mention to a um, event that we put on every year. It is not revenue generating, um, but is super special to us and important. It is the time of the year where we can formally recognize our volunteers and donors with a recognition tea. Um, it's a little afternoon of getting together to enjoy the company with one another. And we also present some awards to some outstanding donors, sponsors, and volunteers without the, within the community. Um, and yes, it, it's, it's instrumental that while the daily thank yous go on, that we have a formal avenue for, for recognizing those that support us. And we want to thank the town of Cochrane um, for your continued and ongoing support. We do appreciate it. And the opportunity to apply for grants um, that help us help people and the pets in our community. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for a thorough presentation that's good and thank you for all that you do for the animals in the area and thank you. Thank you. of course all the people that go along with the animals absolutely thank you is there any uh, Councillor Reed? do you have a motion to put on and some questions a yeah, motion to uh, accept this as a report and then uh, <clears throat> I had a couple of questions if I could uh, I just wish to echo the mayor's comments about the, the great work that you do and uh, <clears throat> and to publicly thank the volunteers who assist you yes. um, you, know, you, you prefaced your presentation by talking about how you change lives, and um, I know at least personally that there are two families, uh, two of my senior staff members who live in Calgary who've come out here to mm -hmm. adopt a dog. That's right. And uh, so when you define your area of service, you might want to even <laughs> include the city of Calgary because I suspect that beyond those two people, there are a lot of others who, who find the services that you provide uh, very supportive. Um, you know, during these tough economic times, I, I know professionally that it's very difficult to, to raise funds. Mm -hmm. I was just curious, do you do any casinos, like as a nonprofit organization, are you eligible to do a casino, and do. do you participate in that? We yep. do. We're in the rural casino bank, so we get a casino uh, about every three years. We actually had one this year in 2019. Okay. Yeah, just a, a word of advice uh, professionally. If you, you can put your name forward on the list of casinos, and if somebody else cancels, you can pick up another casino with before that two-year elapses, um, and it can really benefit your organization. Again, Thank I you. I'll, I'll um, speak, talk to speak from casino experience. Um, last thing I was going to say was, you know, the hiking with hounds. If you if you need an instructor, I, I'm pretty con well convinced that our mayor could handle that job if he had the time. <laughs> You know I have a dog. Right? <laughs> it's I know a very, he has a dog. very popular program, but you'd be welcome. From the Humane Society. Thank you, Councilor yeah, Reed, for putting you. me on that committee tonight. <laughs> I did want to say with regards to Calgary, um, we do adopt uh, about 50% of our animals go into the city of Calgary, and we don't restrict our service area for adoption purposes. It's more um, for taking in animals and just recognizing that there is organizations within Calgary that service the um, population of Calgary, and that's why Calgary uh, is not officially in our um, service area. We will take animals from outside our service area, including Calgary, if we have space, um, and, but there is a surrender fee to cover their care. Councilor Fideko. Thanks for all the great work you guys do, as well as all your volunteers. Uh, you know, I regularly see them walking the dogs all over the place. Um, I was just curious if you guys have anything new, new programming coming up for uh, next year that you uh, maybe didn't speak to or anything like that? I'm sorry, what was I didn't the new, new, new programming coming up for 2020? Uh, it's maybe not so much a, a new programming that's coming up, but um, some internal things, a program for our cats specifically. We're doing a catification of our cat rooms, so enriching the lives of the cats while in our care. We, are, we started this year with outfitting um, or remodeling the cat rooms um, to align better with industry standards in terms of housing, so all of the cat con condos on our adoption side have been renewed, and we are still in the process of catifying the rooms in terms of using wall space and other enriching um, tools and methods so that they get a better use of the room, more time out with varying heights and, and, and engaging um, activities, I guess, and, and structures. And so just to be able to provide the cats with, with better enrichment 
for the time that they spend with us. So kind of a catification program. Program is in progress, hoping to wrap up in 2020. And I was just gonna add, um, with regard to our dogs, we have added additional staff positions um, that deal specifically with behavior uh, dogs, dogs that have reactivity or fear, and we have uh, staff that are, are designated to deal exclusively with those, so that we're hoping to um, rehabilitate them to make them adoptable and put them out in the community. Awesome. Well, again, thanks for all the good work you guys do. Thank you. Thank you. I've got a couple questions. Um, you touched on catchment area. Um, where, how far out will you take in strays, uh, for lack of a better term? Like, um, is it mm -hmm. just Cochrane town boundaries? Is it Rocky View County? That's right. Yes. So. Um, well, within the town of Cochrane, it goes to animal services, first of all. But outside of um, the town of Cochrane, the boundaries go um, Rocky View, um, Bighorn, Mountain View. Um, we service also Sutina First Nation, Morley First Nation, the Stony Nakoda First Nation. Uh, in Rocky View, it's really just up to um, the QE2 on the west side of it. Um, and, and those are the services. And then within the, the city of Airdrie as well. City of Airdrie. Wow. City of okay. Airdrie for cats, excluding dogs. Stray so, dogs found within the city of Airdrie go to their animal services. The follow up question to that is do you uh, receive financial aid from any of those outside sources? Uh, we do from the county of Rocky View. And as well, I should say, from um, the Stony Nakoda Nation as well. Um, we have been partnering with them for a number of years. Um, through various programs, um, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, I look forward to seeing you on the 16th. That's right. Right. Yeah. Yes. Okay. We Any look other forward questions? Forward to seeing you as well. Nope. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, we need to vote on the motion. All those in favor of accepting for information. Carried. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Murphy, welcome. Good evening, Mayor Janung, Council. Um, the second delegation tonight is the uh, Cochrane Public Library. Um, in attendance is Executive Director Jerry Maitland, um, and she's here to, um, uh, to present an update on their activities and, and present their budget and 2020 funding request to Council. So at this time, I'd like to call to the podium uh, Jerry Maitland. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mayor and Council, for allowing us to have this opportunity to speak to you. <laughs> the pictures are the most important part, Jerry. The cat picture was pretty good, too. Oh, I think there we are. Perfect. Thank you. There we go. We began our year with a new focus, and now I'm in the dark, and engaged staff and board members to help us determine what our new vision should be moving forward as we created a new five-year plan of service. We decided that in every way and every day, our goal is to support, inspire, innovate, and educate whenever and wherever we can. We also refreshed our mission statement to reflect our core value, which is to inspire a journey of discovery, learning, and connection. This past year, I've been invited on a number of occasions to speak to rural libraries and to rural library um, consortia about our little library on the edge of the Rockies. We've done so many amazing things in the last four to five years, and other libraries want to do and emulate what we've done, which is a lot of the programming and our library of things um, is really fascinating to a lot of other libraries. And as I've been roaming around talking about our library, really what we're doing is talking about how we provide value to the community. And we provide value to the community not by providing just books and access to DVDs and e-resources and all the things that every other library does, but we do excel at our library of things. So since this uh, started just a few years ago, Canadian Tire and TD Bank 
supported us with the tool lending library and the gardening tool lending library. We have currently, I think, over 50 power tools and hand tools and over 30 gardening tools, and they are lent out on a regular basis. So people come and get wheelbarrows from us, uh, post hole diggers. Uh, we added this year, we've got um, a leaf blower. We have a new power washer. Uh, we've added another generator that seems to be very popular. Um, drills, you name it, we seem to be able to carry a lot of those things. And it also draws in a different um, group of people into the library. A lot of men have found their way to the library, which, is, which was exactly what we were aiming for. So they come in and borrow tools. We have volunteers that come and help us with our woodworking classes and all those things. So um, that has been really amazing for us. Our game lending library. We are now over 115 board games and over 50 puzzles. And we weren't sure how the puzzles were going to go, but people love to come and borrow them. And we are happy to provide that. I've heard a, a number of young couples coming into the library just because they heard that we had these specific games. And they, they run about $85 to $100, some of them. And come in and get a library card and support the library. And while they're there, uh, they discover all the other things that we provide. So we find that incredibly exciting. And I mentioned last year that we were getting life jackets and in May this year we launched our life jacket lending library and we actually loaned out 106 life jackets the first 60 days and over 300 times this summer. So um, I, I, I'm going to say we saved some lives this year. We were very excited about that. And that was um, a donation from the the, uh, the Canadian Life Saving Society, and they actually approached us. We're the only library that has ever done this, and we were a little test pilot for them, so we're really proud of that, and we'll carry on lending life jackets. We also provide value with a lot of the events and the programming we do, not to mention Medieval Day, which is the big event that we do. Uh, this year we had axe throwing that we added, we had these crazy bouncy horses that people were racing all over the front lawn, the Vikings were there, uh, the Knights were there, and we just continue to add on. Now this year we did have a conversation at the beginning of the year whether or not we were gonna do Medieval Day again, and we had so many people asking us about it, and the town graciously provides grant funding for that, but this event costs us around $12,000 a year, and we get a lot of gift in kind from local organizations that help support this. So we are always very excited about that, and again, um, just happy to have people come from all over to experience this wonderful event. Our next big event, we have been awarded so far $10,000 from uh, Marigold and part of that is from the province of Alberta to host an Indigenous program. So on February 22nd, we are hosting an Indigenous author event and we have Richard Van Camp and Aaron Paquette coming just to mention a few. Those, they're really exciting. I'm very excited that Richard and Aaron are coming. I've met them a few times and they're going to come and spend a day and a half with us and do writing workshops. We will be able to bring our Indigenous partners from Stony in for the event and everybody is welcome. The other big thing that we have added to is our maker space. Now, the library is extremely busy these days and I'll get to those numbers and the stats in a minute, but this year we were fortunate to add our 3D printer to our maker space. We've also added microscopes, die cutters, and we even added cash register this year. A lot of the homeschool families like to come into the library and use all of our makerspace resources. We aren't even touching on the robotics and all the other things that we have in that space. We tend to leave a lot of things out for people. They know where the jewelry making is, where the crafting supplies are. We do a lot of passive programming so people can just drop in and help themselves. And the corner where the children, if you haven't been in the library for a while, the corner where the big mural is and where the children's programming area was, we've moved that back into the big program room and moved the kids collection in there and created the maker space out in the open. And it also serves as our tech lab, so we do have laptops that we can plug in and we run for the most part all of our tech programming. And that has been very successful for us and we're doing more and more of that. Just recently, we received funding from Breck and when paired with money from our book sale, uh, by the end of this month, early November, we should have had it sooner. If I had known it was going to snow last month, we would have had snowshoes 
poles and avalanche kits are coming as part of our winter equipment lending library and we've had a lot of people very excited about that and wondering when those supplies are coming so they can use them. The other thing that we spent a lot of time on this year was updating our website. This was in conjunction with a project with Marigold. Um, it's a, a, a new overlay, it's really amazing, it's very friendly, easy to use and it's really helped introduce our patrons to all the e-resources. It's really easy to navigate, it looks fresh and this did not happen without a lot of staff time. It took two months, a lot of background work, a lot of help with our IT group, but staff are um, really excited about what they were able to produce and we've had a lot of really positive feedback about that. So as usual, I'm just gonna go through and update you on some of the st statistics about the library. We do have 19,000 people with library cards these days. The stats are a little um, tricky for us sometimes because we do do family memberships. So we average, we, we calculate a family as two parents and two children. And it's probably a little higher than this, but I'm proud to say that we're probably over 55% of our population right now in Cochrane has a library card. Our program attendance is over 13,000. And that doesn't include our big events like Medieval Day. It's really hard for us to keep track of the number of people who come to that event, but we usually calculate between 3,500 and 4,000 people. This year, the wind picked up at about 3.30 and sent tents and kilts and everything flying, so it, we, it, we tore everything down really quickly. Um, but everybody had a really great time, and uh, we were really pleased to have the mayor and his wife as our royalty this year and everybody participates and has a good time so um, we don't always calculate all those numbers and we always like to remind everybody that we serve everyone we say that from birth to death everybody is, can have a library card and come and use our uh, facility and everything is free we work really hard at making sure that our events are accessible and available for absolutely everybody So these are the averages of through the doors. Now, I look at these stats on a weekly basis. We do a daily door count. So these are, these are kind of mid-range averages, and we've gone up quite a bit since last year. We're up about 10% in physical attendance, but these numbers are really deceiving because we've had a lot of days in the last quarter where we've had 500 people a day through the door. And we we think that a lot of that has to do with our lending library. People are coming in and using the makerspace a lot. The 3D printer's been really, really popular. Um, we've had folks from Chaps in. We're helping them create little horses. They're doing a big diorama. And uh, we are trying to make that available. And currently, we, d we aren't charging for the filament, but we will be. But it's still minimal what we charge for the things that people are making. So on average, we estimate about 130,000 people a year through the doors of that 8,000 square foot space. And we know that we're busy because our materials that come and go out of the library continue to increase. So staff are handling on average about 900 items a day, which works out to over 330,000 items a year. And we're still only at 12.5 FTE. So I always like to use this statistic. Uh, the Public Library Services Board of Alberta would suggest that for a population of our size that we have 15 to 18 just to be at the low end of the service scale. So we do a lot um, in our small space. We have amazing staff that are well educated and work hard and give everything their all. And we, we somehow, we manage. So what we're asking for this year, um, we ratified our collective agreement, so we have a unionized staff. We have professional staff as well, which would be the librarians and our HR accounting person. But this is a 2% increase this year with our QP collective agreement that we're looking for. So this was ratified in January. Um, what we were also able to, uh, and the board approved this, along with the union, was to negotiate an increase in health spending benefits from $750 a year to 1000 And it's always just a good reminder to know that we do not have any kind of pension for any of our full-time staff people. 
And the other thing we're looking for is another uh, one FTE, and what that person would do would be to continue taking, working with programming and, and taking our services outside of the library. Because we are running out of room and space, we want to be able to offer our services outside of the library. And what we would like to do is look for a satellite branch. And for those of you that were with us last year on the, on the library tour, you'll remember going to the Rocky View YMCA and seeing the uh, standalone wallless library that Calgary Public Library has installed in that space. And this is just a picture of what we call smart lockers. They're basically just a self-service box where you can drop off library materials, you can put a hold on things from home or at the library on your laptop, and they will pop into a box. You walk in with your library card, you scan it, and a little door opens and you can take out your materials. What we really liked about the Calgary Public Library model is that they also had some seating around that space. They also had a collection of materials that people could borrow. What was really surprising to me with the material that they have in that open space is that it doesn't walk off. People are really great about um, scanning it and taking it out and returning it so there's been very little theft. So what we would like to do is work on grant proposals and look for funding this year to install a space like this. Um, hopefully we could have a conversation with Spray Lakes to maybe use up a little bit of their space. It would be a really great way for us to extend our services uh, to remove some of the physical abuse that's happening in our little space. And we will continue to see how we can navigate through that. So along with that, I should just mention that we, the library, will look for grant funding to help make that happen. The library board is actively looking for ways to help us uh, find a way to purchase a vehicle. We need a library vehicle to allow staff to be able to roam around and do out of our brick and mortar building programming and to deliver and retrieve materials. So that is the board's uh, focus coming up this year. So every year I bring this to you just to give you an idea of where we are um, and how far we've come. We have really managed to navigate our budget over the last five years and go from, and you know, just a reminder, we always look for per capita funding. That's how we get funding in library land. We get funding from the Alberta government, we get funding from Rocky View, and then we get funding from the town of Cochrane. So our goal is always to get to that $25 per capita middle mark, and we're getting there. We're pretty close. So this year, our ask would bring us up at the current population rate to that $25 per capita. And this is just a per capita comparison. I just like to show you what other libraries are getting. Um, we always are in shock and awe of what Banff and Canmore get. They're in over $50 per capita. High River, which is half of our population, is at $25.48. Stony Plain, for example, very, yeah, they're $20,000, $23.85. So everybody's still fluctuating around a little bit. We're up and down. Airdrie's at $30.31 per capita. So we think that the $25 per capita is a very reasonable ask. So at the end of the day, we're still at capacity. We're at staff's at capacity, our space is at capacity. We're doing everything that we can to move the library forward. I feel that we work really, really hard to provide value to the community. We will continue to do everything we can to do that. We raised over $40,000 this year just in grants to provide operational programming and funding, and we'll continue to look for those grants. Um, as if we stay at our current 12.5 FTE, it's really difficult because the strain on staff is just getting greater and greater. So that's what we're looking for this year. And that's it. Any questions? All right. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, Councillor Flowers, you're our representative on the library board, still. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. I really like the idea of the um, programming moving out to other areas so that it can contact even more people. 
and I am pleased to once again be the rep for next year and work with you. We're happy to have you, Susan. Thank you. <laughs> Councilor Padeco. Thanks for the information. I only have one question. Um, what happens if you don't move up to the $25 uh, per capita rate and you uh, stay at the $23.33 one? Um, what kind of impact that does that have on the library, I guess, overall? Well, what happens is every year as the population grows, the per capita drops. So we're always doing that catch up. We will still manage. We're doing okay. We were really worried about what was going to happen with our Alberta funding. And it looks like we're going to get what we were expecting this year. So I think you're all aware that we received half of our funding um, at the end of September. And we don't know, it hasn't been confirmed by the government for sure when we will get it. But I imagine it will be in the next few weeks. So we're fine for this year. But as the community continues to grow, we are still underfunded at $25 per capita. We are one of the few libraries left in the province that charges for a membership. But that's $65,000 a year in revenue that we can't afford to let go of either. So, But to answer your question, we'll be fine. It'll, it'll be tight, but we'll make it work. We're really, we're, we've really mastered how to manage our budget. And is it tough, is it tough to attract, you know, um, obviously good people into some of those positions, you know, as, as librarians go or, or anything like that? Is it getting tougher to attract people? Well, we, th th this increase this year and over the last few years with the unionized staff has really brought everybody up to a fairly reasonable working wage. It wasn't five years ago, but we've come a long way and that's where the majority of our funding goes. It's almost 70% of our budget is staffing. So librarians we get the young ones they work really hard we have Andrea has been with us for a little over three years now but you know she can go and make thirty thousand dollars more for example at Calgary Public Library um, what keeps people hanging around is the amazing opportunities that we continue to provide at our library not everybody has the opportunity to do the programming that we do and to be involved in the event planting and the planning and the grant writing so we work really hard at trying to keep them but I also encourage them to spread their wings when possible too. So we are at three professional librarians right now, including myself, and that's we're exactly where we should be. As soon as we hit 40,000 people, for every 10,000 you should have a professional librarian, which is somebody with a master's degree in library science. Perfect, thank you. You're welcome. Councillor Nagel. Thank you very much for your presentation. It's uh, wonderful to see you guys are getting really creative with the stuff you're uh, <laughs> delivering through the library. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe elaborate a little bit on the vehicle that you said you guys are looking to purchase for the library. We, are, we aren't looking for anything fancy. Um, people still talk about bookmobiles, people talk about book vans. Um, a van that was outfitted with a, a collection would be great. We can drive that all over the place and it gives us the capacity to deliver services. What we really just need is a vehicle, any kind of vehicle. And it, this has to do with having unionized staff. Right now, I cannot let unionized staff drive their own vehicles to do outreach. Hmm. I can let the professional staff do it. They also cost me more per hour. They're driving their own vehicles and then we're paying them mileage back and forth. So would it be cost effective? I don't know if a vehicle is going to be cost effective, but it will actually help us to get staff out and about. So what exactly kind of... Um driving around would they be doing? Are you guys delivering uh, books to people or? Well, okay, so for example, let's say we had a satellite branch somewhere. They would drive that vehicle, they would take materials with them, they could do programming, they could take part, part of our maker space with them, they can take books, we can go out to Stony. Um, we do do some programming out in Brad Creek right now and a little bit out in Springbank but that's limited due to the budget that we get from them, so we maybe go out to Bride Creek once a month. And the librarians do that. So we could go to daycares, we could go to the schools, we could do more of that with the vehicle. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Councilor Reed. Thanks, Jerry. That was a great presentation. Thank you. I'm excited, I'm excited about all the stuff that the library's doing. Um, I was just trying to clarify in my own mind, <clears throat> that, so the $25 per capita, does that include your entire wish list? So the van, the satellite. Uh, oh no, that's just operational money. Okay. Yeah, everything else is outside of that. <laughs> and the, the and we're, we're hoping to raise funds. Sorry, Alex, we're hoping to raise money to um, sustain the vehicle. I don't expect the library itself to pay for that. We'll look for funding for that. Okay. 
the, sat the satellite, was that a position or, a, or was that the smart lock lockers? I, I call it a satellite, but it's the smart lockers. Okay. Yep. And the price tag on the smart lock lockers was what? Right now, it, to have a smart locker stack with 24 lockers is $40,000 installed. It's come right. down substantially. Yeah, that, I was going to say that's a lot cheaper than what it was mm -hmm. when we saw on our tour. So I'm yeah, so they have that. 120 boxes at the Calgary site. Right. And when they did all of that inclusive, Bill Potasik had told me it cost them a little over a half a million dollars. But right. that was the furniture, that was everything oh, okay. that you see there. Yeah. We could do something amazing for $150,000. Okay, great. Thank you. Good job. You're welcome. Councillor McFadden. Thank you very much for your update. And I clearly have to tour by the library. It's been a bit, but I know that in the gaps when I, it always changes whenever I do stop in. Um, I just wanted to, uh, I really appreciate the comparison you provided in uh, the per capita funding that comparative municipalities have given. I just was wondering if you could clarify for me um, how much the, the provincial funding that's coming to you, do they issue that per capita as well? Yes. Okay, a at $25? No. So we get $5.50 from the government. Per capita. Per capita. And we get a little under $5 per capita from Rocky View. And their population this year was up at 14,500 people that we serve. That, that you know we're Rocky View resident? Yes, that we, they're actually part of our catchment. So we do get funding from Rocky View based on that population. Okay. Yep. At five dollars and fifty cents, you mm -hmm. say? Excellent. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So it was five fifty for the from the province, but under five. From I want to say it's four fifty off the top yeah. of my head. I didn't look. We were expecting a little more, but I think it's four fifty from Rocky View. Yeah. Councillor Wilson. Thanks for the presentation, Jerry. Um, I was part of the tour that you did for us when we went and we checked out the locker space that we were <laughs> talking about. That was. Definitely eye-opening. I'm, I'm interested in when we're talking about the 24 locker idea. Any idea what kind of capacity that opens up? How many people that could potentially serve? Um, any stats on that? And also, when we're talking about overcapacity problems, would that likely be something that could, in, could at least temporarily um, increase our capacity to be able to say our current square footage is going to be okay because of the satellite space that's drawing people to it? I'm well, it, it would get us that. by, it would get <clears> us <throat> through. Currently right now, and, I, and I, I think I say this every year, the calculation per capita for square footage for a library is 0. 0.6 square feet per capita. So we should be around 17,000 square feet physical space. The space would probably only take up a couple hundred square feet at a satellite branch. And I cannot answer that question for you off the top of my head, but I would say probably 100 to 200 people a month would use that locker space. But I will do some research for you, Patrick, and I'll get some numbers for you. I thought it was a very innovative way of thinking of how libraries can move going forward, and um, yeah, I'd appreciate that. I know it's not part of our current ask in the budget, but it's definitely something to think about as we look long term. And I, I think, think we can get grant funding for that. We, that okay. would be a capital ask, and there is money out there, so we'll go searching for that. And finally, did I see that would, was it just a projection that that would require one FTE for a satellite branch, or is that currently? Well, that's what I would use that, that money for this year, would to do extra programming, and we would drive it outside of the library. Uh. And they would help serve a smart locker space. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much. You're welcome. Okay, great. Good questions. Uh, most of mine were answered. Um, just have a couple, and I think you've kind of touched on most of them, but the, um, um, the obvious need for new library space, and you just referenced it, 17,000 is what the rough number would be if you use the per capita times 0. 0.6 square feet. At our feet. current population. At, yeah. Right, so that's no growth. Um, what is your plan to bridge the gap for space as we have identified seven to 10 years before we could actually get to building a new library. So I think part of the answer is satellite. <laughs> mm -hmm. So what I'm hearing, is that part of your model going yes. forward? Yeah, we have to do something. We just can't, I don't even think that little building is gonna be able to sustain 500 people a day walking through its doors. And we have three public toilets and we have one staff washroom. So we're really beating that building. Um, I don't know. We have to find innovative ways. If you weren't putting a parking lot on that space, I was looking at an Atco trailer next door. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
um, we're just going to have to get really creative and talk to the community and how do we do that. It's not cost effective to break staff up and to have little areas here and there and everywhere, but certainly um, staff that are going out and about, maybe a bookmobile would be the answer, traveling around to the school and getting out to those people that are homebound and can't get to the library. So I think there are lots of ways. We're going to have to find answers to those questions and they're going to have to be innovative. We have talked about using some of the um, transit and innovation space that will be built across the street. Certainly, you know, creating flexible space that people can come and go and do different things in would be very, very helpful. We really cannot serve the tech needs of this community unless we have a, a technology lab. So that would be first and foremost on my list and it doesn't have to be on our space, it could pretty much satellite anywhere. And then we can look for funding for the technology itself. Good. I just was planting the obvious seed yeah. of uh, next steps. It um, keeps me up at night, Jeff. It <laughs> does. Um, me too. <laughs> Uh, and you, t you touched on it, so good segue, the, uh, the concept, the current concept we have for the innovation in the transit hub mm -hmm. uh, and the proposed parking across the street. Yes. Um, how do you see or have you as a board discussed that? Has, will it impact your um, function? Will it add to? Is it uh, something you're planning again in the future? Well, I think that's just going to increase our traffic through the doors, first of all. I think we've seen a little bit of increase with transit, people coming in and waiting, and the, we've seen Colt out front, so that's been very exciting. Um, I think the more people that are in the core and in that area, and the easier it is for them to access our space, the more people we will see. And hopefully we're not driving them away when we're busy, right? right? Um, I think that the innovation space will be a really big boon for us. And I was in Kitchener and did go through um, the Communitech space okay. and Velocity and was really impressed and was able to connect a lot of dots with the nonprofit side. So I'm still mulling that around, but I will be reporting that visit to the board. Excellent. And we'll carry on working with that. That's good to hear. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for your presentation. I don't see any other questions. Uh, Councillor Flowers, you put the motion on the floor. Uh, all those in favor of accepting as information is carried. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're moving into bylaws, but we're going to do 6A first. See Ms. Knight giving me the evil eye over there to make sure I stay on track. Thank you for that. Friendly eye, we'll call it. Hmm? A, a break? Um, okay, yeah, we can. Two minute break before we, do you want to get your slides set up? I'm going to give you an opportunity to, Okay. thank you. Two minute break.
Okay, we'll call the meeting back to order. Thank you, Mr. Nordquist, for yes. allowing us to take a break. No problem. So, good evening. So, tonight, and just I'm before, in sorry, just before you get into your uh, your item, um, Councillor Flowers was not here for the public hearings for this, so she needs to vacate the room. And Councillor Nagel, you wish to declare conflict, okay? So, Councillor Nagel will be leaving as well. I think you have to leave the room. In fact, I know you do. Um, and we'll uh, call you back. Okay. Maybe. Everybody scatters. The rest of us will stay and right. hear your report. Thank you. All right, thank you. So, Fireside Stage 2 Neighborhood Plan Amendment. Um, so, this is an amendment to support a change from the live work units identified in the center of the neighborhood. Uh, as these live work units may no longer be viable. So the applicant is proposing to amend this neighborhood plan to support a land use bylaw amendment uh, later tonight to redesignate this land as residential. Uh, so the community context, uh, Fireside is one of our, is our southmost neighborhood located off Highway 22. And specifically this neighborhood plan deals with stage two, which is the west half of the neighborhood and is currently under development. Uh, the lands in question are the commercial mixed use lands highlighted uh, in red here, uh, which would be redesignated as uh, R2 residential, um, as well as there are proposed changes to the central park to the south of this land and the park to the north. Um, so the land use proposal is to change from mixed use commercial mixed use to residential single and two dwelling district. Uh, so the neighborhood described this land as street oriented townhomes with the opportunity for live work units. Uh, however, these live work units would allow for a variety of business developments, uh, but it would be limited to art studios, medical clinics, offices, personal service shops, and some retail sales. Uh, so this proposal would then see this land change to a combination of single detached, semi-detached, and street oriented townhomes. Uh, the commercial policies from the neighborhood would be removed, as well as the neighborhood node policies will be updated to include a mix of residential and local amenities for this area. Uh, and there will be a minor shift as the number of dwelling units decreases to accommodate uh, local amenity in this area. Uh, and this is just highlighting the proposed land use redesignation, showing that the R2 would be uh, similar to the adjacent land uses. Uh, this is just the statistics table showing uh, the change. Again, approximately 14 dwelling units will be lost. However, this is to provide space for the local amenity, which is currently being proposed as a daycare. And the overall density will not change that much. So other amendments to the neighborhood plan uh, includes adding a community garden to the park north of the neighborhood node, as well as the removal of the community fire pits from the central park. There's also an administrative update to update the name of the National Fire Protection Association. Uh, so we're just gonna go over the open space changes. Uh, so first is the addition of the uh, community garden located north of the neighborhood node. Uh, highlighted in red there, uh, as well as the removal of a uh, fire pit from the Central Park location. Uh, and just in detail, uh, this plan shows the location of the community gardens in the current neighborhood, in the current park scheme, as well as the removal of the fire pit. Um, the structure around the fire pit will remain, including the benches and the activity space there. Uh, so planning evaluation for this, uh, it does meet uh, three of the pathways outlined in our Cochrane Sustainability Plan. So pathway eight is met by adding amenities within the planned neighborhood uh, to create a space for the community to socialize. Uh, it meets pathway nine by offering a variety of housing types within the R2 district uh, to provide a roof over everyone's head. As well as pathway 11, uh, the, this does increase the population within 400 meters of the Central Park and proposed garden, uh, adding to the connection and usage of these amenities. 
Uh, it also meets our municipal development plan. Um, so of the five principles for new communities, uh, principle two speaks to the social and cultural well-being. Uh, so this meets the social needs of the residents by developing a node uh, for recreation and relationship building and supports amenities that create safe, healthy, and a comfortable environment in the neighborhood. Uh, as well as principle four, uh, this amendment would help support the existing businesses in the Fireside neighborhood overall. Uh, public consultation, a non-statutory public hearing was held on October 15th. Uh, comments from the Cochrane Planning Commission were presented during the public hearing. Uh, this uh, amendment was circulated internally and externally for comments and concerns, and we received comments from both fire safety and economic development that were presented at the hearing, as well as letters were sent out to adjacent landowners, uh, and no responses were received. Uh, so administration is recommending option one that council adopts the amended fireside stage two neighborhood plan and I'm available for any questions okay thank you for your presentation councillor McFadden you have a motion I do uh, I am going to actually put forward um, option three in that uh, council put forward a motion to adopt the fireside stage neighborhood two plan as amended and then vote to defeat said plan. Um, and my reasonings are this, in that uh, going through the review um, and in looking at the overall plan and the diversity of what we're looking at in Cochrane, my priority is to provide a diversity of housing and product um, across the community and to make sure that we're looking not only at what the market is looking at uh, delivering today, but the, the need of the community over the next 15, 20, 40 years. And so I really liked the uh, live work uh, units as a, another option that could be part of our community. I think it adds diversity as opposed to um, the R2s, which is kind of a standard that's becoming across our entire community. I think we need to really look at a community about providing more diversity of housing on different styles to attract different folks. Um, I did, that was my starting point. And then, so then in listening to the argument, from the developer, the first was, this isn't a product they think they can sell now. The demand isn't there. Um, but in the initial neighborhood plan, they had actually identified that as possible. I think it actually reads that it was expected that the live-work units would be uh, developed and built out later in the plan, um, which I'm comfortable with that this could be a product that's delivered later in the development of the area, but this is the right spot for that type of an area. Uh, that type of a product. Um, so again, just from the need for a, a diversity of product, um, I think overall in the future what I want Cochrane to look like, this is what I'd like to see. Um, and then on a smaller case um, on the amenity of the fire pit, um, and we have other fire pits in town that act as a recreational amenity uh, that we don't seem to have any difficulties with. We've got them down at the uh, down by along the riverfront park, and we've got them at um, the ranch. And so, um, yeah, and I understand, like I, I did see the note from the fire department, but I know that we are also managing that risk um, already, and I believe it's amenity that uh, the folks in Fireside, um, you know, we're expecting, and I think it fits and can be amenity that we manage. So um, I'm putting forward that we uh, certainly discuss this motion, but I would like to see it defeated, as I think the existing plan serves the longer term needs of Cochrane. Okay. Councillor Fideko. I'm also uh, in support of what uh, Councillor McFadden's bringing forward. Um, there are a couple things that I didn't like um, in that presentation from the developer when I asked specifically about uh, the concern about swapping out the amenity of the fire pit to the community garden. Uh, I asked, you know, whether or not there was any sort of consultation done with any of the residents or anything there. Uh, it was said no, um, you know, they didn't deem it, I guess, as maybe uh, something that needed to be done. And while I agree it's a very, very small amenity item that we're talking about, to me it goes back to no different than any other neighbourhood here in Cochrane where people are expecting to find something on their plan, just like going back to the Heritage Hills and people see that plan and they're expecting to find that and then again we just say, oh well, we're just going to make a change. And I, and I really, I want to move away from that because whether or not you live in Sunset, whether or not you live in Heritage, whether or not you live in Fireside, I think that if 
people are expecting to find something and we're not and we're not giving them the opportunity to speak and we're just deciding that uh, that's where I can understand where residential uh, frustrations come in so with that being said um, I, would, I would back your, your motion Councillor McFadden okay I'm just taking a note here need more engagement Councillor Reed. oh sorry Councillor Wilson okay thank you um, I don't have a lot to add on the green space in the community fire pits part. I think that was perfectly stated by both the previous two councillors. I agree wholeheartedly in both those comments. Um, in the, in the uh, CMU to commercial mixed use to R2, I was, before we started deliberating here, generally in favour of that. And I guess I have a question that goes with it. Uh, Adam, can you tell me the childcare space um, that, that's going in there with the proposed new plan that would only happen if we were to redo the zoning, is that correct? Just to know what we're... Um, through the Chair, currently the proposal for the child care is part of the neighborhood plan amendment. Um, the you. land use redesignation would just redesignate the land as R2, which um, as a discretionary use does support child care centers, um, but it's only specifically spoken as a local amenity in the neighborhood plan. Okay, thank you. Can I just interject sure, please. there? Yeah. That, I'm not clear on, so the neighborhood plan amendment is needed to allow the child care facility no, to go, or is it still discretionary use under the... Uh, through the chair, it would still be a discretionary use. So there's still an ability to have it under the existing neighborhood plan, but it needs to go through CPC. Um, uh, sorry, uh, through the chair, just to clarify quickly, um, so the use of a child care facility, um, I believe what you're asking is if the land is to be redesignated to R2, um, it would still be um, permissible as a discretionary use. However, it is a neighborhood plan amendment tonight that is being amended to support the land use bylaw amendment. Uh, without the neighborhood plan amendment, the proposed land use bylaw amendment isn't actually in conformity with the neighborhood plan. Right. So my question is, do we need to amend the land, the neighborhood plan to allow for the child care facility to have? I know that's land use and we're getting to yes. that. We're kind of crossing um, the streams here a little bit. Yes, but. at this time, uh, the neighborhood plan amendment is needed so that the land use identified uh, can be redesignated. Okay. Does that answer your question? It does. I'm, gl I'm glad you brought that up then, so I didn't understand it. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, if I uh, can as well, uh, Adam's correct, and I just want to clarify in terms of some of the amenity amendments that are proposed. Uh, okay. The developer has made it uh, quite clear to administration that uh, those amendments uh, came up through the circulation process. Um, they're really... Uh, not as focused on that. They're focused on the ability to do the land use amendment more so than the fire pits or the community garden. So just so council can uh, perhaps take that into consideration as they deliberate this. So what you're saying is we could remove, we could keep the fire pits and that out and leave it as it was and just deal with land use? Correct. You could direct administration to uh, deal with the uh, various amendments based on council's discussion and, and include the land use amendment. From what I've heard so far, that was principally what I'm looking for. I'm generally supportive of the uh, land use change as long as the amenities aren't changed. That was the only part that was bothering me, but I'm still open to hear more debate on, on why that shouldn't happen. Right now, I'm still for it, though, I guess I would say. Okay. Curious to hear what others have to say. Councilor Reed? Yeah, I, until, uh, until we arrived tonight, I was thought this was uh, it was a good move other than the question of uh, the fire pits. Can we go back, Adam? How much public engagement was there on this whole, the fire pits, in addition to the change in use? Uh, yes, so with the neighborhood plan amendment, uh, there were three parts. So there was a sign posted, so development notification sign posted on the site, um, as well as letters sent to all adjacent property owners and it was published in the newspaper. Um, this is our standard engagement process for any uh, plan amendment or land use bylaw amendment. And uh, <coughs> excuse me, secondly, what, what diversity of product is there out there 
along the lines that uh, Councilor McFadden is interested in, is in terms of the community itself. Do we have much of that in the way of product? Um, currently in Fireside, um, I'll maybe jump back to my presentation quickly. Okay, so this uh, is our stage two land use concept. So it does show uh, how this neighborhood is planned to develop. And there is a combination of R1, so uh, traditional single family detached, as well as R2 and um, a uh, high density. So an, uh, it would be our RM district uh, near the Central Park, as well as uh, street oriented townhomes at the south end of the Central Park. Right. <clears throat> what I was asking, though, I think, well, I mean, I'm sorry, I wasn't clear. So the diversity of product that Councilor McFadden is referring to in the community of Cochrane, <clears throat> is there much of that available? Oh. I think she was talking about, if I understand, a mixed residential commercial it's development. live work units. Right. Okay. Um, so, yes, yeah, through the chair, there is existing, um, so townhomes with uh, live work units. Um, so uh, Sunset uh, Ridge is one example in the trading post. Um, those units were originally developed as townhomes with slope work units. Uh, however, um, as the uh, comments from economic development reflected, uh, there has been poor uptake in the live work unit portion. Okay. So they're primarily just being used as residential right now. Yeah, I guess my concern would be to have this land just sitting there, <coughs> um, even in the near future, uh, with nothing on it in the middle of a community, it just doesn't, it seems awkward to me, but thank you. Councilor McFadden. Thank you. So, and I certainly do um, want the, the child care uh, business to stay in the neighborhood. I'm sure it adds uh, something that's needed for that neighborhood. Uh, just to clarify for me though, the, uh, the child care uh, product could be moved into any R2 zoning? Um. Yeah, yeah. It's through the chair. Um, it is a discretionary use, so yes, um, any R2 land use could be used as um, a child care facility. Right, it's provided yeah. the plan it was approved at the planning commission level, yes. right? So in the diversity of products, so here's my challenge that I have as a broader community right now, is all the yellow is, dark yellow is R2, correct? Uh, and R1 is a light yellow. Correct. And so that entire map is just showing a standard type of development replicated across our entire community. And so the only diversity of housing in this right now is where we're looking at right now, the maroon color, and the smaller ones on the bottom. And so the child care unit, which I completely support, can actually be solved anywhere in their R2, which they're trying to build on now, which they're having trouble selling. So I think it would be, it could fit, it can be delivered on with broader answers than keeping a live work unit open. And when you look at the initial uh, neighborhood plan, the developer at the time had indicated in their own documents that they weren't expecting that to be built out to later in the plan. When you're looking at the live work unit success in our community later on, big picture, 20 years out, you're gonna want that pr product to be towards the heart of the community, it's not something you're going to be able to add later as you move to the western boundaries of our community or into a suburb location within this context. So I would much prefer that we give it a year or two uh, to keep it as it is and see if it can be developed out. And I really think we as a community need to start looking about what type of diversity of housing um, we can add into Cochrane so that we're not just building the same type on eight or nine different major developments across. So this is a small piece of that, but I really think we're not serving the community as a whole. We're not standing our ground and asking for even a small par part of diversity of housing. So at, you know, at the end of the day, this switch would just deliver more of the same old, same old. And I'm asking for a unique piece of housing to be retained. 
Councillor Fadeko. Um, just a couple of questions. Is in future uh, stages, is there not uh, a live work unit that's also coming to Fireside just at a different spot in a, in a different stage further on? Uh, uh, through the chair, the other live work units proposed in Fireside are proposed for stage one. So that's that existing commercial area um, beside Highway 22, which is still uh, under development. Okay, and we have a guarantee that uh, this daycare is, is wanting to move into uh, this area. That's that's kind of the idea. That's you know, uh, if if it gets amended, obviously by council. Uh, that is a proposal from the applicant. Yes. Okay. I I mean again I. I could probably be somewhat swayed on, on I guess, the amendments. Um, I, I'm not going to be supportive of the community enhancements, but um, thanks, Mr. Hyman, for explaining that, that they could be separated. The only thing I wanted to clarify as well, uh, through the chair to Councillor Fideco, is my understanding is that the daycare is an existing daycare that's already in the community. Uh, it's outgrown its space. They wish to move into this new space, which is going to be customized for them. So. That's perhaps the reason, or that is the reason for the uh, application. And as I indicated, uh, the fire pits were something that was included afterwards as part of the amendment process. So, thank you. So, sorry, Councillor Pedico, what what was your last comment that you you support the motion on the floor? As I could be, I think I think I could be swayed to kind of. I mean, the live work units, and especially if we have another opportunity for those to happen in that in that community, I'm. I could probably take a look at that. I, I'm just not in support of us um, taking out amenities or swapping them without, to me, proper engagement. So yeah. that was my biggest hang up. But I got that. I was just missing the, the last part there. But. Yeah, I, okay. I think that, you know, depending on what council kind of decides, I could probably yeah, be yay or nay, especially with the fact that we have other potential of the work units to come further. Okay. Council McFadden. So. And again, I'm certainly supportive of the daycare, especially I think it's so important for communities to have that type of service in their community for sure, um, which is evident in the fact that they're so successful, they've outgrown their space, which I think is a great success. But from a larger planning perspective, um, to do your neighborhood plan based off of one development permit for that business, I mean, this is a, a plan to do your, set your land use for like decades. That business could move in there and be successful for a year and then move out again, and you would have changed your land use to just service one business need. Um, so as a planning process, I disagree with it, but I think I'm the, the lone voice wanting to keep a unique housing um, option available there. That's my final point on that. Mr. Devana had a point, I think, to add on <coughs> that last uh, um, Yeah, I'm certainly supportive of the land use, but I just want to put forward on these fire pits. It does, as administration, we are concerned that there would be a fire pit, unsupervised fire pit, in the middle of a residential neighborhood. And, um, you know, if the ashes are to get away, um, it is a significant risk. And that's why administration would like the fire pits removed. Um, you know, last time I checked, Cochrane's very. Windy. <laughs> so that's my concern. <clears throat> you have had a pretty large fire fireside. Councillor Wilson. Thank you. That adds to my points. Uh, during our Cochrane Planning Commission meeting, uh, Councillor Fredick will remember this too. As we zoom out, if you could do this for me, Mr. Norquist, to the entire community of Fireside. So we see what we're talking about on the last, right before you just had it there, the last, that one. Um, what we're talking about right now is deep into the community and I, I very much appreciate what Councillor McFadden saying I want to see diversity of options in Cochrane that's an excellent goal in this case I think it's buried a long way into the community to see that I'm sensitive to the reality that along the highway side is more likely where units like that are going to be utilized and that they're just simply not moving there's no market for them and I, I'm sensitive to that reality I, I, I'm worried as Councillor Reed said that they could sit there unused for an indeterminate amount of time. So I'm generally supportive of the use change here. Um, so that's, that's my opinion still on this. On the, on the fire pits, I'm interested to hear what the difference is between our current community fire pits and, and these ones and why 
the ones in our parks are not considered dangerous, but these are, I guess it's the proximity of houses to it, even though it seems to me like there's adequate green space between them. Uh, I, I still remain unconvinced on the need to change the park amenities is all. And I don't know if we, if I hear a whole lot of. You know, I just have to state the obvious. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You know, I appreciate that too. Yeah, you know, it's it's an obvious risk when you put it in the middle of a neighborhood that you're exposing it to some risk. It's not in a town. Uh, you know, we're going to have to go and make sure it's put out and properly from an administrative point of view, and and so it's a risk. And I just need to state it. Right. You guys Proximity to houses was the answer to the question. I answered it myself. I assume is the general concern. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. I think that I think I know where I sit with this, and that's uh, generally in favor minus uh, the community amenity. I'd like to see the fire pits uh, retained as they are in the proposal. Okay, back to you, Councillor McFadden. So you promised I, that was your last point. Yeah. I know, but then I disagreed <laughs> with the next point. Um, the uh, so the with the fire pits. I mean, we still as a municipality allow residents to have backyard fire pits already surrounded by homes and trees and everything else. So we already allow them in our backyards. Um, this is probably, in my opinion, safer than in a recreation area because it actually has more of community eyes on it at all times and then surrounded by, you know, short grass. So in balancing off the risks, we already allow people to do fire pits in their yards. So it's an amenity I think people are, we can manage. So, still disagree. On changing lives. Last chance. No? Okay, well, I've not said anything. I, actually, Councillor Wilson, you've captured my thoughts to a T, uh, other than the risk of the fire pits, but uh, Councillor McFadden, you uh, make a good point on, uh, on that suggestion. But I, I, for one, think it is buried far enough into the community. It's a small patch. Um, and we have a business that wants to relocate and do well. We're looking for more commercial. Uh, this is uh, an opportunity for that. Um, we do give up a little bit as far as diversity, but um, I, I think, as you said, Councillor Wilson, you've said all of it, so I don't need to repeat. But I won't be supporting the, the change, or the motion, sorry. So, no, yeah, motion is to defeat, or is to, Sorry, this is an odd one. I need help. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you like Mayor, if I can provide some guidance. The option three that is presented to council um, on all pu public hearing um, bylaws, neighborhood plans, is something that council can put forward a motion to adopt. That motion could then be defeated. It, that is the way that you defeat a bylaw, is the, the reading has to be put forward and then defeated. That's how we handle the neighborhood plans as well, despite the fact that they're not statutory documents. So rather than it being previously, council struggled with it being a motion to defeat, it is a motion to approve and then by way of voting yeah. you defeat it. Okay, gotcha, thank you. I was there at the beginning and then all this debate, we'll call it. Um, so the motion is to put the uh, neighborhood plan on as, as amended, which would be option one, yes. So are we now, I'm hearing, you want to amend that even further to take out the amenities. So someone would have to make an amendment to the motion. I got there on my own. Councillor Reed. So if I understand what we're trying to achieve here, um, we're looking at option one but with an amendment to take out the amenities. And so if that is the case, I would move that as the recommended option. Is that clear enough direction? Stacy, is that good? Okay. So the, the, and that yeah. was the only real change was the fire pit. Correct. Okay. And the community guard. Yeah. Um, so uh, to, through the chair to clarify, the motion would be to approve the neighborhood um, as amended uh, with exception to the open space policies listed, which would include the changes to both the community garden and the fire pits. Yes, I believe that is the intent. Yeah, okay. Any more debate on that motion? I think we've covered it pretty much. All those in favor of that?
Opposed? It's carried. Thank you. Respectfully, Mayor, that was a vote on the amending motion. You now still need a vote on the main motion. Of course we do. Thanks for catching that. Now, all those in favor of the motion as amended. Carried. Uh, opposed, sorry. Carried. Okay, neighborhood plan. So now we can move back to 5A in the agenda, which is now land use for the same area. Uh, yes, uh, so this is the land use bylaw amendment, specifically speaking to uh, phase 10. Uh, so the small parcel that uh, we were previously talking about. Um, so uh, as mentioned, it was previously identified as live work units. However, due to the need or the feel that it's no longer viable, they wish to uh, redesignate it so it can be uh, used as a residential development. Uh, the community layout once again, as well as highlighting uh, the area which is now amended to show R2 in the neighborhood plan. Uh, so this redesignation would be for 0.91 hectares uh, from residential commercial mixed use uh, to residential single and two dwelling district. So under the land use bylaw, live work units do allow for business development and this proposal would see that being replaced with a combination of single detached, semi-detached, and street-oriented townhomes, which are all uses listed under the R2 district. Uh, again, just showing uh, the adjacent land uses as well as the area to be redesignated. Uh, so the planning evaluation. Uh, so uh, amendment has been brought forward to the neighborhood plan. Uh, so this land use bylaw amendment is now uh, in compliance with the neighborhood plan. Um, so the purpose of the R2 district is to provide for single, semi, and duplex and street-oriented townhome residential develop and to allow a blend of different housing form. Uh, and this may include uh, accessory and garden suites. Uh, so this will ensure that the land is primarily residential uh, with a variety of housing options but will still provide for daycare facilities and home-based businesses as discretionary uses. Uh, public consultation, a statutory public hearing was held on October 15th. Uh, we presented comments from the Cochrane Planning Commission. Uh, we didn't receive any concerns from any internal departments or external agencies. Uh, and letters were sent to adjacent landowners and one response was received in opposition to the land use redesignation. So uh, administration is recommending option one that council gives second and third reading to bylaw 23 slash 2019. Okay, thank you. Council, any motions to put forward? Councillor Wilson. Yes. I'm, I'd, I'd move option one that we uh, approve or give second and third reading to bylaw 23 2019. And I have no okay. debate. <clears throat> Any comments, questions, debate? All those in favor of second reading? Opposed? It's carried. We'll carry on to third reading. All those in favor of third reading? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you. Thank you. Take a two minute break and get the councillors back in the room.
Sorry. <laughs> Good evening. Welcome. We're back into uh, bylaws. Take it away. Good evening, Mayor and members of Council. Tonight I am before you to present Bylaw 29-2019 for consideration of first reading and to establish a public hearing date. This is a land use bylaw amendment to redesignate the newly annexed lands in Sunset Ridge to a town of Cochrane land use district. So this is a map showing the community of Sunset Ridge with the subject parcel highlighted in yellow, which is just north of Sunset Stage 3. This 40-acre parcel was recently annexed from Rocky View County in July of 2019. The subject parcel currently has a Rocky View County land use designation of ranch and farm district based on their land use bylaw. This bylaw is proposing to redesignate the subject parcel to residential urban reserve, which will bring the parcel into compliance with the town of Cochrane land use bylaw. Um, this is a snapshot of the URR district from the town of Cochrane land use bylaw. There is currently a residence on the parcel, so this land use designation will allow for the continuation of the current use until further development of the land occurs. Prior to any further land use amendments, the land will need to be planned through an area structure plan and neighborhood plan process. So with that said, administration is recommending that council give first reading to bylaw 29, 2019, and that council establishes a public hearing for bylaw 29, 2019 for Tuesday, November 12th, 2019. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your presentation. Council, any motions to put on the floor for first readings? Councillor Fadeko? Uh, I'll move that we have uh, option one uh, that we give first reading to bylaw 29 2019 and establish a public hearing for Tuesday, November 12th at 6 p.m. Any comments? No. No? Questions? Debate? No? Call the question. All those in favor? It's carried. Thank you. Five C. Bylaw thirty one, South Pole Landing Road closure. Having a deja vu. Yeah. Administration's had three or four deja vu vus on this, I believe. Yes. Uh, this is um, the fourth iteration <laughs> of this proposal. Um, so. Uh, this bylaw is bylaw 31 2019 and it is for road closure. I'm presenting it uh, tonight to rescind the previous bylaw as well as uh, uh, get first reading and set a public hearing. Uh, so this bylaw proposes the closure of a portion of the undeveloped road lines, uh, and this will only affect the south half of section 26. Uh, whereas the previous bylaw, bylaw 02 2019, included a portion of the southwest quarter of section 25. Again, this road closure is needed to facilitate the relocation of the existing Alta Lane transmission line. Uh, so, this is just a quick context map to show uh, the area in question, as well as in red is the current Alta Lane transmission line. Uh, so the proposal would allow it to be re relocated along that south boundary in yellow. Uh, this map is of the proposed road closure. So in blue is the area that would be uh, closed. And in teal there is the area that has been removed since the previous bylaw. Uh, so this would allow um, at legal <coughs> access to that north-south road allowance. So the parcels to the west would have legal access through this road allowance to the north-south road allowance in South Bow Landing. So uh, we are recommending tonight that council rescind the first reading of bylaw 02 2019, then give first reading to bylaw 31 2019, and establish a non-statutory public hearing for bylaw 13 2019 on Tuesday, November 12th at 6 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Nagel. I'll move the first motion that Council rescinds um, bylaw 3902 19. Or, sorry, bylaw 02 2019. Okay. Any discussion on that? Everybody understands what we're up to here? All those in favor? It's carried. Thank you. 
You want to carry on? Sure. I also move that we give first reading to bylaw 31, 2019. And set a statute, non statutory public hearing for. And set a non statutory public hearing for bylaw 31 2019 on Tuesday, November 12th, 2019 at 6 p.m. Okay. Uh, respectfully, Mayor, that should be a statutory public Or no, I'm sorry, that is a non statutory. Never mind. Okay, we're good. You said non statutory? I sure did. Okay. It's recorded. All right. <laughs> All those in favor? Carried. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nagel. 6B. Ms. Guida, you're presenting the Spray Lake Sawmill Family Sports Center Reserve Development. I am, and I'm going to find it first. There we go. Just move through a large chunk of our agenda. <laughs> Uh, good evening, Mayor Janung and members of Council. I am here to speak to you about the Spray Lake Sawmills Family Sports Centre Reserve development. On September 23rd, the Spray Lake Sawmills Family, uh, or sorry, Recreation Park Society presented an update to Council and at that time requested that Council consider doing a $1 million line of credit for um, development of programming needs as well as um, emergent capital items. Uh, at that time, Council sent administration away to come back before the end of October to provide a report on how this could work and what kind of criteria we would put in place to accommodate this. So administration has been working closely with the Park Society staff to talk about how this might work. What's before you tonight is um, not a line of credit. That is not something that a traditional line of credit. What administration is actually proposing is that we set up a reserve of a million dollars for the society to access funded from the town's current operating reserves. Um, this will not impact the, your 10-year financial plan. It's from the operating reserves. Um, it would be set up as a separate reserve, which the park society could draw on. Um, what we are proposing that they would use it for is fund program development, growth projects, and to improve customer experience, not for capital items. This is not intended to be used um, for capital life cycling or emergent items being that your capital uh, request you'll see in your budget later tonight and further in the month as you read it, that Spray Lakes has life cycling as part of that. So it would continue to be part of the regular budget process. This is intended for them to access throughout the year if a program comes up or amenity or something to increase customer experience and drive more people to the center. Um, to access these funds, we're proposing that the board of directors would have to approve a motion and this would be provided to, uh, the motion would be provided along with a business case to administration. Administration would re review that, make sure it meets the criteria and the intent of this reserve. And w if it did, within a, we'd commit to doing that within a month so that um, we could release the funds if it did meet the criteria. Uh, withdrawals and repayments can occur at any time throughout the year. So if, for example, they s draw th through $30,000, let's say, to build a program space out to meet the needs of a new program. Uh, the return on investment on that program was quite quick. They could pay it off $10,000 in a month or however that worked out for them. They don't have to wait till the end of the year or annually to make any payments or uh, withdrawals. Um, currently, uh, we have set in our tax, in our operating budget, tax-supported operating sub subsidy to Spray Lakes of $951,000. In your three-year uh, budget, or in their three-year budget, their intent is to slowly get down to that or below. So what we're proposing administratively is, is asking them to commit to, once it gets below that, that they automatically start putting that difference toward any balance on that reserve. Um, no interest will be charged on the outstanding balance. Annually, we'll meet with, administration will meet with the board uh, to review withdrawals and discuss future repayments, so have an annual review of it. Following that, administration is proposing we'll provide a report to council on the status of the reserve. So outlining what came out, what went in, what it was used for. Uh, the intent of that is to keep it very transparent, very open as to where they're at and, and how it's working. Uh, this is, we've um, proposed having it open for 10 years, so it will be repaid in full by December 31st and closed to their ability to withdraw. Um, Again, we're proposing setting it up as a separate reserve, not a line of credit. So traditionally, a line of credit is a little bit different. And you don't, well, I've had one for years. I've never had to repay it. So this is a little bit different um, in that it's a reserve. It's controlled. 
uh, administration would be the ones making the, the um, decision as to if it, the withdrawal fits the criteria. Again, it's not facility life cycling. As you know, uh, we're 50% owners of the facility with Rocky View County, and life cycling of that building should be shared amongst the two of us. Um, again, we'll work closely. So, what we're asking is that Council approve the creation of a reserve of a million dollars to be funded from existing town operating reserves that can be drawn from and repaid over a 10-year period by the Spray Lake Society. Thank you. He outlined it perfectly. Thank you. Councillor Reed. Uh, option one, that council approve the creation of the reserve of a million dollars to be funded from the existing town operating revenues or reserves. <coughs> um, I want to speak to it as well then. They, um, I'm, I'm comfortable with the dollar amount and I'm comfortable uh, with the stringent criteria that's been put in place. Again, this reserve will only be used when and if it's necessary. And to re-emphasize that this is separate from the capital life cycling, um, and to be clear, so I'm um, just so I'm in support of it. Okay, thank you, Councilor McFadden. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I just had some clarifying questions. Um, so this isn't quite the um, ask that the association was coming to us with. That's so, correct. Yeah. So administrations put some Guidelines. parameters and accountability. To, to council and therefore the rest of Gawkins taxpayers around this. Okay. Um, and so and then the reserve funds are coming from where? J just I just want this clarified. Where the reserve funds to fund this are coming from, and then there's no no impact to the taxpayers to fund this. So uh, through the chair to answer Councilor McFadden's question, yeah, it's coming from operating reserves. So current um, we have about a ten million dollars sitting in operating reserves and. Through your 10-year financial plan, those don't actually get drawn on. We put a lot into them. Some of it gets drawn from, but it, even after 10 years, it's still sitting at that 10 million. It's, it's that kind of that backup for us when we have one-off operating type um, things. But we don't anticipate it's a risk to have that there. Again, the intent is it's paid off. So really, you're not going to be, at the end of the 10 years, you should still have the 10 million that you had. So it's not coming from uh, current taxes. It's not going to affect your capital program because it's not coming from a capital reserve. Okay, so the only potential downside is that we, we're not going to be able to make any interest off of that money sitting in our reserves because another group might be spending it. Correct, unless it sits there and they don't draw on it, then we're still making the interest on it, so it's... Okay, and is it there at any point, like, so it's a million bucks, which seems like a lot of money. It is a lot of money in my world. Um, what, um, is there a point, like, the idea is that any request that they had would then be vetted through... Um, our administrative team to then okay it. Is there any point where we thought about having, would that number ever reach a point where we'd want it to bring it to council to see if they've suddenly got like 200 or 300,000 of that ask? So through the chair, the, the intent is not to do that. Um, council can keep in mind that they do have a representative on the board, um, currently who is Councillor Reed, that it has to get vetted through the board first. So I think I mean, that could help with that. Um, we hadn't indicated if they come with us for half a million and it's a great program or 200,000 and it looks great and, and the business case is there, we hadn't proposed bringing it back. Okay. And then I guess finally, as I understand part of the argument of this is to allow the uh, Spray Lakes to be nimble and to be able to take advantage of opportunities. Uh, so then what, what will be the turnaround timeline for that to happen? Is it... can working with you know, their team to determine they need to take advantage of an opportunity then to present and for our team to okay or not. It's, a fairly, it's gonna be a fairly quick turnaround. Yeah, we've committed to within a month um, it, how long it takes them to develop it and get it to their board. But once it's in our hands administratively, we've committed to making that decision within a month at the most. Yes. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to get a better handle on it because it was a new request, <coughs> new type of request I've never seen before. Councillor Fideko. Uh, thanks. I, I agree the million dollars seems a little steep to me. Um, what kind of measurables are we going to determine, like, oh, so they decide that this program sounds good? I mean, what kind of measurables are we using to actually determine, you know, maybe they have five requests that come forward. I, I just don't know what that looks like and how often they're uh, asking for funds, I guess. 
Yeah, I don't, uh, through the chair to um, answer Councillor Fredeco, I we haven't said there'd be this many measurables. I guess what we're looking for is a strong business case. So they'll have to do their homework and bring it forward. Personally, we'd be looking for ROIs. What's return investment? What is, you know, I have a recreation background too, so what's in the industry? We we use our, our people as well. I can give you an example of something that they did this year without coming forward to this. Um, they decided they needed a new space for doing a six-week challenge and some different um, working workout options for groups and so they've created a space that's now being rented out by different groups to use for group group training um, so they put the money in themselves to do that uh, to build it do the construction believing that program would drive people to come and, and basically create operating funding so basically to help them become more sustainable so they presented that business case to the board the board approved it they were able to fund it um, out of their operating because they believe their return on investment would be quick. So that's an example of something that was vetted through the board first. They didn't come and ask because we didn't have this up for them, but that might be something that would come to us. And to clarify, this could not be used for a change of staffing or anything along that line, or, you know, if they decide to put up offices or change the physical space, it's strictly for programming and... Uh, correct. The intent is not to expand offices and that type of stuff. That is growth, or that is... Um, structural stuff. I think that if something like that came forward and they needed the funds to do that, they would need to come forward as part of a life cycling request or part of a request to council or get a grant. This is intended. Now, in saying that, if it's to build a program space or to outfit a program space, it would fit. But just to put staff in a space and offices, it wouldn't fit the criteria. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Nagel. I'm uh, fairly uncomfortable with this uh, number. Can you please remind me how large is Spray Lakes' annual operating budget? What, mm -hmm. Do you know the number? Councillor Reed, do you know offhand? I don't know. Okay, sorry. Is it, is it like <laughs> 4 million, 10 million? I believe it's close to 6 million, but I can't, I'd have to get that to you, but I believe it's close to $6 million. I think it's over 6.8. Yeah, 6 to 7, somewhere in there, yes. It, it just, it, this seems like a really large number, so we're talking like, what would that be, like 15%? of the annual operating budget, we've just given them a line of credit. I, I'm also not totally convinced of the need. We've always covered um, Spray Lakes' deficits ever since we built the new aquatic center and stuff. Mm -hmm. They come here, we give them money when they explain their business case. I would rather us just stick with the current um, setup where you know if they have something they want to invest in, they can come to us, they can ask for the money. Um, if, if this is related to a cash flow issue for their operating expenses still, I'd rather them come to council and be transparent about it and um, ask for a specific amount of money with a specific business case attached rather than us just uh, basically signing off on a blank check for a million dollars. Um, but I, I also do, all, I, you know, I want to acknowledge that I understand the board is a volunteer organization and that ultimately they're doing this as volunteers. So I don't, I don't uh, hold any grudges against the people who are asking for this, but, but I'm uncomfortable with this. Yeah. So to, to answer your question around coming, coming to council, um, Councillor Nagel, um, that was something they talked about and they, they feel that it would actually um, create less work for you guys, right? So if they're coming every other month because they've got a new idea or every month and they're asking for, they're, gonna, they're coming with their handout all the time, they wanted to be able to control that a little bit, that's why we've gone with this approach, just so you're aware they were, you know, they've always done that, that's right, but they wait and do it at the end, right? As opposed to being able to be nimble with it don't know if that helps, but that's that was the idea. Yeah, well, I guess I'm just thinking, you know, that's where I'd rather maybe give them a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars just to do one-off stuff here and there. But a million dollars is a lot of money, and I'm I'm not comfortable with uh, handing over that much financial power. Okay, I'll weigh in, I guess. And oh, sorry, Councillor Flowers, go ahead. In my mind, it's bridging the gap, so you know that the money's coming, but it's just spacing it so that they can pay their bills and keep up. Is that correct? Um, no, well, the intent of this is not is not that. The intent of this is is more about being able to uh, start new programs, right? So if they were just going to continuously operate the same way they're operating every year in and out, um, they probably wouldn't need something like this. But to um, you know, if if something comes along, like I'll use boot camps for an example, they were all their age you know, a few years ago, and you've got to be able to respond to that because they need, their members are asking for it, and so if they had to build a new space, right, whereas the cash flow thing, um, they're figuring that out now. They've had a, a bit of a struggle this year with some cash flow, but the intent is that's not, this is not going to cover that in future years. 
but you still know that a new program is going to bring in new income. So that's the intent to pay it off with the new income. Absolutely. And if they can plan it far enough advance, it'll be part of their budget as opposed to being something like this, right? So if they're, if they're saying, you know, this year we're going to focus on this and it's not mid-year, they'll put that probably in their budget, right, where they're putting this much and expecting this much revenue. I agree with the concept. And I, too, think maybe a million is pretty steep, but maybe half that would be <laughs> better. Okay, well, um, I see this as a loan to ourselves. I really do. It's a town facility. It's operated by, by a volunteer board, which you pointed out. Um, they, uh, the checks and balances are, are put in place, and I thank administration for taking the time to put those in, because I think the ask in, at the beginning was a bit, you know, free flowing, and this allows for a transparent process. Um, and let's be real. Uh, if this doesn't, if this facility doesn't work, the worst case scenario is it reverts back to a town operated facility and we will be signing a million dollars away every year in operating costs just to uh, change back to a town facility. Uh, I think we have a deal, a real steal of a deal with a volunteer board putting in an effort that I have seen and Councillor Reed, you're uh, uh, been uh, boots on the ground there with these uh, with this group right from the beginning of, of the last two years um, very good people doing very good things for our community for free uh, out of the goodness of their heart and there are a lot, there are other groups like this in town the, the difference with this one is our taxpayers are getting a break on this because of the way we're operating so um, I visited the board right after the election uh, went to a meeting, went and then followed up with another meeting a couple of months later. And I have to say, I, I observed a board that was gripped in financial um, quagmire. They were, uh, and I, I really admire them for it. They were all well-intentioned volunteers sitting around the board, worrying about where the next penny is gonna come from, what next presentation they're gonna have to make to council to ask for two more, uh, instead of, thinking about providing recreation for our community. And I know there's a balance between cost and uh, deliverables. And that is, that is true. That is something that we all have to weigh on every single situation. But um, every other community in the province has looked at this model as something they would like to aspire to. Uh, Grand Prairie, um, Tabor was just here uh, last week looking to do the same model. Um, and every single mayor I've talked to in mid-sized cities touts our facility as a success story. Our cost for the return on our investment is low. So a million dollars for them to be able to be nimble, take the pressure off. And I'm not saying now they have no pressure to worry about finances and just go for it. I trust this group that they have the best interests of our community at heart. So the question I asked them, and I believe Councillor Reed, you were there, was why did you put your name forward for this volunteer committee? And it wasn't to manage the finances of a $100 million uh, piece of infrastructure, which is what they've been asked to do. It was to provide a better soccer experience for my daughter who's in soccer, to ensure there's uh, colder hot water in the showers, depending on which one you want, um, et cetera. Um, so I, for one, see this as a, a, a bright light uh, in a way, and I, again, back to administration, have, has found a way to keep the checks and balances in place to allow them to operate in a better place. The fact that they are willing to pay back the money is bonus, I see, in my, in my view. Uh, we are basically putting this money back into a different pocket, that's how I see it, with a group that is willing to operate it for us. So I'm fully supportive of the million dollars, the way that administration has put it out. Councillor McFadden? So and I certainly agree that the uh, Spray Lakes Rec Board have been an amazing resource and something we should be justly proud of, a volunteer group that is leveraged and leveraged and leveraged again to create a facility that rivals any in the city of Calgary. So much to be proud of. Um, it's just my concerns are the same with, uh, I think, Councillor Nagel's. It's a million dollars in context that's, you know, one-seventh of their annual operating budget to be available to them. And so I think I'd be much more comfortable 
with all the checks and balances proposed for about uh, 500,000, and then they would have to come to us for anything above that, just to balance off that, allowing them to be nimble, but also that transparency piece. If we spend $500,000, it's out in the public, everybody knows about it, and it's obvious. And I think um, that's what we should require of all of our partners is the same level of accountability and transparency. So it's not a matter of that they're not doing an awesome job. It's just a matter that it's a lot of public money. Okay. I Personally, I don't see the difference between 500000 and a million dollars with the transparency. But, I mean, uh, this is a step forward. Um, but you'd have to make an amendment to the motion, I guess, if that's what you'd like to see. Um, personally, I don't see it's necessary if we're asking for the, the, the reporting period that I understand, Ms. Guida, is that this would come back to Council at the end of every year for a report on what money has been spent, what money is left in the uh, reserve, um, and what they used it for. Yes, annually we would do that. Whether it's the end of the year or mid-year, yes, once a year we'd be coming back and giving the report. So if we want more transparency, we could increase the number of times you reported back, or Council Reed or our Council... Yep. Representative could give us an update. It could. It could meeting. become part of your quarterly reporting as well, if that's what council wants. Where it's at our, I mean, quarterly we come in and do first quarter, second quarter financials, third, right? So we could roll it in as part of that. Councilor Pedeco. Uh, I'm also in favor of Councilor McFadden's uh, five hundred thousand dollar. I think that also, you know, this this is different than what they first came forward and asked. Um, but also, I think it's perception to the public that they see it as, oh, the town's giving uh, the Spray Lakes Board another million dollars, right? And it, it's not even uh, they don't even have the, quite the understanding of what the million dollars is for. And I'm I'm scared that we're starting to get into an, a a public opinion that we're just giving them cash all the time in in all that checks and balances and stuff on our side, we get that, but does the public understand that? And I think that uh, a, a million dollars is a lot, and I agree, Councillor McFadden, that, you know, what if they have the opportunity to bring something forward that they need more money for, uh, then let it come forward to Council, and then it does become more uh, transparent and into the public. I, I think a million dollars is just too much, and, you know, I, I hope that it would go all swimmingly, but I don't even know what those checks and balances are, and, and how we're or not those, uh, the measurables, sorry. I don't know what those measurables are to find out if a program's even successful. I mean, do they come back and just ask for more money? I, I don't know. I don't know what that looks like. So I think I'd want more information before I open that wide open to a million dollars, personally. Councillor Wilson. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm leaning no altogether on this, and I, I, I just wanted to hear what it would look like if, if we do vote against this altogether, Ms. Guida, and they want to, so they want to be nimble and they want to create new programs that they see opportunity to make money on, so it's a new boot camp, we'll say, and they need a space for it. Under the current situation, they have to come to us to ask for that funding, mm -hmm. and that's what would continue to happen if we voted no against this reserve? Um, I thought that's what I expect would happen, and whether then they pay it back or not, that would be up to the council. They've never offered to pay it back before, so that would be the one thing that you'd want to be thinking about every time. Right. Thank you for that. I don't know this. No one's told me this, but uh, I feel if we voted against a reserve, that uh, it's very likely that that board would come to us and say, here's the keys. You guys run it. Uh, that's not a threat. I just feel that that is, and Councillor Reed, maybe you can speak to that. Uh, but I, I do feel that. Uh, this is allowing them to operate in a way that they can uh, deliver recreation to our citizens. If we're going to be uh, over their shoulder on everything, we might as well just operate the facility. We either trust them with the job that we've entrusted them with, or we take it back over. And then that is with the cost of doing that at the same time. Councilor Reed? I mean to put you on the spot, but uh, yeah, no problem. Um, <laughs> no, I appreciate what's being said. Um, I, I'm hearing what my fellow councillors are their concerns. Um, I've got to tell you that I I think that uh, the likelihood of this board uh, turning the facility back over to us is is probable. 
um, you know, it's a question of either pay, we pay them now or pay them later. And if we pay it later, we will be paying, you know, uh, way beyond what we could afford, I mean, you know, and to, as a community. I think this is a facility we got ourselves into. I think we need to be able to recognize that this board uh, was kind of, I don't want to say pushed, but certainly um, this board was, this was not their, of their choice or their making, and they're making the best of it. And I think this is, they're asking for a sign of support, and I think this is a support we should give them. And I think if we don't want to do that, then I think you, we should think seriously about what the implications are in terms of risk. Again, it's not a threat. It's just a, if you're measuring the, on the scale of return on investment, you need to really think about what the risk would be as a result of our decision tonight. So I'd encourage you to, to think about that. Councilor McFadden. Um, I mean, I haven't spoken to anybody on the board on this. And I know just like those of us who step up for council, we all step up not to manage budgets, because honestly, that's boring. Um, we step up <laughs> to create an amazing community. And so and I know the people that have stepped up to do that and put in their time to do that want to do what's best for our community in whatever way they can. So I can't even start to believe the story that if we don't give them a credit card worth one-seventh of their operating budget, they're going to hand up back the keys. Um, I don't think that's a, an honest... Well, I'm, not, I'm taking back the word honest. I, I just don't see that as a, as the, a true narrative. Um, so I would uh, actually amend the recommended option then to read that a $500 million reserve will be created using, sorry, 500,000, <laughs> sorry guys, yeah. uh, half a million, $500,000 reserve be created using current funds from the operating reserve um, to be funded from the existing town operating reserves that can be drawn from and repaid over a 10 year period by the Spray Lake Sawmills Recreation Park Society. You're mending it to half. Yes, that's really what I meant to say. Okay, and I think the uh, Councillor Reed brought up a good point too. Um, this is a board that was operating at cost recovery up until the point that the town asked them to now operate a pool. Um, they are one and two years into the pool, um, finding their way, uh, changing their structure. Their staff has increased to 250, 40. Um, so I, I don't feel that the ask is unreasonable. Uh, if we're going to lose it, um, I obviously would vote in favor of the 500000 but um, I would rather give them what they asked for, show support in the board. Um, we, I feel we have the checks and balances in place and the transparent process to keep council and the community apprised of what's going on. Um, I just I don't know why we would uh, send them that message. but. If we're going to lose it over a five or a one, then I'll settle. But I'd like to hear from the rest of you. Mr. Devana? Uh, if you do go with 500,000, uh, you know, we can commit to review the amount after one year to see whether it should go up to a million dollars. Um, you know, if it's, if it's insufficient. Flowers. So that we can analyze it and see if it's working the way that we hoped it would, because it is a new thing. It's a big amount, and we are open to criticism for it. So I, I would like to see it be a pilot project, and we can always increase it um, in a year if we chose to. Okay. Anyone else? We're voting on the amendment when we're voting, so. Councilor Padeco? I'm in favor of that as well. I mean, I, I don't want to get into, you know, do they make the best decisions? Would they make the same decisions that, you know, the town of Cochrane would versus what uh, they decide to operate that facility as? I don't think we have enough knowledge as to, um, you know, what their staffing is and if they're making all the best decisions with the money that they have. I mean, I, I don't want to get into that, so I mean, I think $500,000 is fair if they have a bigger request and if we need to then we could always adjust it but to just hand over somebody a million dollars and 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 I don't like the threat aspect and I agree maybe at some point the town will have to take it over but I think let's cross that bridge when it comes down to it it's not to say that we um, are totally untrusting but I think that the public would require us to 
have maybe uh, maybe have more uh, more say than just giving that over to a volunteer board is what I'm saying, right? So I think from a public standpoint, I think that they would want to see that rather than us just saying, well, you know, we're, we're scared that we're going to own it one day anyways. I think that the public wants to see that from us. Okay, and everybody understands that the money would stay in the town account and is withdrawn on, uh, on an application basis to administration who then goes through the checklist that Ms. Guide has outlined tonight to say yay or nay. It's not here's a million dollars, sorry, do what you want and report back to us. It's, it's the opposite of that. So, that was what you were going to say. <laughs> Councillor Nagel. I'll vote in favour of the amendment because I think it's a step in the right direction, but honestly I think it's uh, still too much money for me to be comfortable. Like $500,000 just handed over without a detailed plan is a lot of spending power for us to sign over in my opinion. And I wouldn't even consider it for any other volunteer group. Like the Cochrane Planning Committee is very hardworking, very intelligent, capable people. No way would I sign over that group five hundred thousand dollars of spending power. So, yeah, I, I still just, I'm not comfortable with the whole idea. Like uh, Councillor Fredego is saying, you know, I don't know if the residents know what this money is going to be for. I don't know what this money is going to be for, to be honest. So, I don't know. I don't like it. <laughs> It's for recreation in our oh, community. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we've talked enough. Um, unless anyone else wants anything to add, I want to stifle debate. So we are voting on the amendment to take it from a million to 500,000. All those in favor of the amendment? Opposed? It's carried. Now we will vote on the new motion, which is to uh, allot $500,000 um, reserve, sorry, I was going to use the wrong term there, uh, to the rec board. All those in favor of that motion? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you. All right, 6C, business, off-leash criteria in developing neighborhoods. Not existing, developing. Developing. Mr. Luft. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council. I'm here tonight to present to you the off-leash criteria in developing neighborhoods. And I'm just looking for, for that. There we go. Technology works when it yeah. works. And I've gone paperless tonight, so, <laughs> so bear with me. Um, it's all good. Thank you for the opportunity to present tonight. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm here to present off-leash criteria in developing neighborhoods. And um, as a little bit of background, in, in February of this year, Council approved the criteria for off-leash spaces in existing neighborhoods with a follow-up recommendation that criteria also be created for off-leash spaces in future developing neighborhoods. On July 8th, with endorsement from the Parks and Recreation Committee, administration presented Town Council with criteria for off-leash spaces in developing neighborhoods. At that time, it was recommended that the criteria be returned to the Parks and Recreation Committee for revision of three points. On September 24th of this year, uh, the Parks and Recreation Committee reviewed, revised, and approved the criteria as it will be presented tonight. So in review, uh, we currently have four off-leash areas as per neighborhood plans. They're located in Sunset Ridge, Heritage Hills, Fireside, and South Pole. Uh, 
the dog off leash area in Sunset Ridge is located at the northern end of stage three in Sunset Ridge is illustrated by the blue arrows. And here's a satellite image of a uh, satellite image of Sunset Ridge. Um, the highlighted area at the top of the screen shows the location of that dog park. Uh, the concept drawn taken from the stage three neighborhood plan uh, shows that this particular space is approximately two acres in area and has a variety of amenities. Residential lots and that, that'll be one of the key factors of the uh, uh, criteria. The fact that we will be adjacent to, to residential lots. Uh, in this case, the residential lots back onto the, the dog park at the north end of the development. Uh, Heritage Hills Dog Park is proposed for the northeast corner of Stage 2 development as per the neighborhood plan. And you can see on the slide the big, big black lab in the corner there indicates where the, the dog park will be going. Uh, a satellite image of that same park uh, so shows the space located at the northeast corner of Stage 2 Heritage Hills development at the intersection of Township Road 262 and Range Road 43. The concept plan drawing from the neighborhood plan shows an area of approximately five and a half acres with landscaping and seating features. The proposed dog park is located in a utility right of way. Uh, the fireside off-leash space is located on the west side of the development. The area is approximately 3.6 acres, also near a regional pathway. Uh, residential lots border this off-leash space on the east side of the development. Now there's the satellite image of, of where that off-leash space will be located adjacent to existing fireside. Uh, the South Bow off-leash space is proposed for the south border of town. This one's a little different in the fact that it's a 20-meter wide strip that runs for uh, a distance of about 1.6 kilometers, which equates to about 8 acres in total. And again, a satellite view to give you some perspective of where, where that space is proposed for. Uh, the linear pathway shown at the bottom of the screen uh, in this case is more of a natural setting. Uh, neighborhood plan shows a granular path and described as a multi-user rural interface. Uh, this area will share a fence with residential lots on the north side of the property in the greater majority of the space. Uh, given the current proposed spaces and keeping future spaces in mind, the Parks and Recreation Committee took uh, shared fence lines and multi-use areas into consideration while developing this criteria. The original proposal of July 8th uh, for off-leash spaces in developing neighborhoods is shown on the right side of the screen. Uh, with points 9, 10, and 13 highlighted as points flagged for revision. Uh, point 9 was flagged due to the pathway issue. Uh, point 10 was flagged due to a fencing issue. Point 13 was flagged uh, as a result of the gates. And in our revision, the left side of the screen shows the revised proposal uh, with the revisions of point 9 and 10, along with the removal entirely of point 13. So we, re we reworded uh, point nine from off-leash areas not to straddle or intersect regional pathways to where an area is designated as a multi-use area. The off-leash area will be separated from regional and local pathways by a fence. Uh, we reworded point 10 from where adjacent to major roadways the area be fenced to off-leash areas will be contained with perimeter fencing. We did make a minor adjustment in point seven. Um, the minimum of 1.5 acres, we reduced to a minimum of one acre in point seven. 
So when we get it all cleaned up, the criteria looks like this, and this is what we're recommending for adoption by council tonight. Um, point one reads, off-leash areas must be identified by the developer no later than the neighborhood plan stage of design. Uh, we've seen that one. Uh, off-leash areas should have clear and discernible boundaries. Off-leash areas should not interfere with wildlife corridors, environmentally sensitive areas. Off-leash areas to have a minimum two access points with double gates. Waste receptacles be located near entrances to off-leash areas. Boundary and applicable bylaw signage to be clearly posted. The area should be a minimum one acre in size. School properties and sports fields should not be considered as off-leash spaces. Uh, where an area is designated as a multi-use area, the off-leash area will be separated from regional and local pathways by a fence. Off-leash areas will be contained with perimeter fencing. Off-leash parking should be integrated as a part of the design where feasible. Off-leash areas will not be established on a temporary basis. And point 13, playground equipment will not be incorporated into off-leash area spaces in developing neighborhoods. Our options tonight are that option one is recommended that council adopts the revised criteria for off-leash spaces in developing neighborhoods as presented. And option two, the council accepts the presentation as information and provides administration with further direction. At this time, I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you for your presentation. And I just wanna say thank you for the maps. They really help. Uh, as, you know, looking at uh, different parts of town and tearing apart things and saying the northeast area of this or the southwest corner of that, uh, it's way easier to see on a map. So thank you for that. And also, uh, if you would pass along, and I think Councillor McFadden will as well, uh, thanks to the Parks and Rec Committee for thank you. revisiting this. And with that, I see Councillor Nagel, you have your light on, but this is Councillor McFadden's committee. Would you like to uh, move or would you like to... Uh, Allow Councillor Nagel. I've already turned my light on. Oh, <laughs> all right. Uh, yes, I'm uh, pleased to move the recommended action that Council adopts the criteria for off leash areas in developing neighborhoods as presented. Um, I'm super proud of the work that the volunteers did in mapping this up and then um, addressing um, concerns and, and some good flags at Council's in the last meeting. And, um, and I think we really landed in the right spot to make sure, and the main point of this for me certainly was to ensure that we weren't building in conflicts between user groups while uh, making sure that we were delivering the need for you know so many of uh, our residents whose dogs are a large part of their lives. So I think we've landed in the right spot. Thank you very much. Councilor Nagel. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, I think it's perfect. Um, so the areas that you identified with the maps, will administration be taking steps automatically to uh, bring ASP and neighborhood plan amendments to plan for dog parks in those areas? Or is or those just strictly for example of where it might be applicable with this set of criteria? The areas that were, or, pardon me, to the to Councillor Nagel through the chair, uh, the areas that were identified were all are all identified in the the uh, neighborhood plans at this point. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess I'm not clear as to the second part of the question or. or, or are, are those dog parks already planned in the neighborhood plans? Yes, they are. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Excellent. That's it. Thanks. Councillor Reed. I just wanted to <coughs> publicly thank the Recreation Board for the work they've done on this and, and accommodating all the requests that Council had made. And I think that this gets us to a really great place. Um, the other comment I had to just pick up on uh, what Morgan was suggesting is, so will the developers now identify this as part of their um, promotional material? You know, you know Councillor Fideco has, has repeatedly said appropriately that, uh, you know, when a developer puts in, you know, amenities in an area and then looks to change them at a later date, it, it's really discouraging for those people who had bought into that area because of those things. And so I would hope the developers would take that to heart and be able to move this forward. It's not a question I'm asking, it's a comment <laughs> I'm making. So. <laughs> Councillor Fideco. Thanks for all the work that you did on it. I, I just want to uh, make sure that it's for all dogs, right? So we're not limiting this to like a small dog area or a big dog area. This is just for all dogs. Is that correct? Yeah, to Councillor Fideco through the chair. Uh, the proposed areas, this criteria is for all future areas. We haven't at this point designated 
the any areas to be smaller or large dog park. And I imagine proposal. if somebody wanted to see that, that's going to come forward uh, at a further discussion. Maybe if, if you know, in a, if say in that area where you have like a, a 1.3 kilometer strip that, you know, if there's something that we needed to do in that area, that, that would come forward at a later time. It, it certainly could. Um, it would be, it could be an option when we looked at the design of, of that stage. Um, I think that area is set up so that we could have two distinct areas uh, if that's the, the direction we decided to go in. I think the option is there. Yes. Perfect. Thanks. Thank well, thanks for the work. Thank you. Councillor Nagel. Um, I'm not sure if you're able to answer this, but uh, do you know when we might be able to expect uh, the dog parks in some of the new neighborhoods, specifically like South Bow? Um, like that's going to take 10 to 20 years for full build out. Will the dog parks be built early on? as soon as they start their stripping and grading in the earliest phases? Or is this something that we're not even going to see till like 2030, 2035? Or? Uh, to Councillor Nagel through the chair, my understanding from my discussion with, with some of the planning team is uh, the Sunset Ridge Park, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Drew, but uh, the Sunset Ridge uh, Dog Park is, is three to four years out. Um, the Heritage Hills is might be four to five. Uh, Fireside, uh, I'm not exactly sure around the timeline on that one, and, and South Bow, again, sorry, I'm not sure as to the exact timeline. Um, yeah, okay, thanks. Councilor McFadden. Thank you. Um, yeah, and it's what you bring up, Councilor Nagel, is, is not really on the criteria side, but I completely agree, I think, with where you're going. Is um, I'd like Council to maybe see if there's a way that we can encourage uh, these amenities to be put in first before it reaches that from a developer's point of logical progression of I've got houses next to it then I'll put the amenity in um, I would like uh, administratively for us to see if we can start uh, pushing for um, you know some of the trails that we know are going to be there regardless into play in advance of the housing and the amenities like the off-leash dog park uh, to have those built out in, in advance of the houses reaching there the sooner the better in my opinion so that might be a task for us to do separately Wilson. I have a two-part question. Um, it doesn't ne necessarily put Mr. Luffs on the spot. I'm, I'm just wondering for the entire table, what, what's the need for all this regulation we're putting in place or off-leash spaces? I just, I, I don't quite understand what we're accomplishing. And, and then the second part of it is on like on the current pipeline corridor where we have a really successful off-leash off dog park, in my view, I understand that we wouldn't be able to build one like that again with all these new regulations and that's because of um, obviously conflicting user groups. I was hoping we could just speak to those two things. What's the need? Why are we doing it? And then um, what are the consequences? Can we not build dog parks like that anymore? And what consequences might follow from all these regulations? I think if to I the may, table. Um, <clears throat> we are a government. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm kidding. Uh, we need to have regulations in order to give people clarity on where and how they can build these or not. Um, I think that's the shortest answer I can give you. Uh, and then if you're buying an, a lot and you didn't want to live by a dog park, you can look at this list and go, uh, I'm safe. Or you can say uh, the opposite, I want to live by a dog park. I know there's going to be one there and it's going to be of this general nature. So I look at it from glass half full saying, and I'm with you, red tape reduction, um, that you got, you got to provide some clarity for people to know and developers and uh, homeowners or buyers and new people to our community about what they're buying into. And I think this locks it down. And if anyone else wants to add to that rant? Um, well, not to the rant, but if I can <laughs> add, um, I was part of the development of the pipe, the one on the pipeline, and actually you could do it with this criteria, and the one oh. in Firesite is actually on the pipeline right away. The, in the corner up there, that's actually part of the pipeline right away. So it's utilizing that space to do it, but the criteria is important so that we can put them in the right spot, basically, right? So that there we don't, the, the issue around um, the multi-use is really around the current dog park we have down by the river where it's a multi-use pathway. It's the only way to get to the rec center. And so what we want to do is try to prevent that. So this criteria helps us do that by saying dogs, the dog off-leash areas are separate from our regional pathway system. They might be alongside it, but it doesn't impact you on a bike who maybe does not want to be with the dogs, but can still use the multi-use pathway. It's not trying to stop um, 
dog parks from going in, it's trying to make sure every user has a space. So I don't know if that helps, but that's why the criteria is there. It does, those are good answers. Thank, thank you, but thank you for the mayor's answer there. Um, so we have dog parks currently in town that don't, I, I still don't understand how the dog parks, we have two or three in town that wouldn't uh, abide by uh, rule nine, is that correct? Separated. This is for developing, so new neighborhoods. Right, for new ones, right. Yeah. yeah, and then we have a separate list, separate list of red tape for you on yeah. uh, on the uh, existing ones. Okay. So, and they're different. Okay, thanks for uh, thanks for humoring me. I just wanted to ask them. <laughs> oh, appreciate it's it. good questions. Councilor Reed, your light's on. Um, just, I recall having uh, looked at some of these dog parks in the city that actually the developers had built these and right. there was no cost to the, the city and uh, they saw that as another amenity in terms of attracting the rest of the community. I don't know if we have uh, that kind of relationship with our developers, but it would certainly be one that I would hope that the administration would take into consideration as we move this forward in these developing areas. Again, it's not a question, it's a comment. <laughs> Councilor Nagel. I just wanted to uh, speak to Councillor Wilson's concerns. I, I support this set of regulations to provide some clarity as to where we can have dog parks come in the future because in my experience, particularly, I think it was worse than the last council, but there's a big demand for dog parks. Clearly, people want them. We go to build them and then they get planned behind people's houses almost, almost every time. It's where people have bought into a neighborhood, paid a premium for their house backing onto a green space where they go and have barbecues with their families or have a you know, a drink with their wife on a sunny evening or something, and then all, now all of a sudden they're freaking out because they think there's gonna be 500 dogs yapping in their backyard. And it, it causes a lot of conflict in the community. And uh, providing clarity as to where we wanna put them in the future, I think is gonna service the dog owners in the community as well as provide clarity to homeowners. So I, I really like this red tape, <laughs> but yeah. I like how we're using the provincial lingo. Yeah. <laughs> For and against them. Okay, any, uh, Councillor McFadden, you had one last comment? Oh, I was just entertained, but I think this is pretty good, uh, layman red tape. These are, <laughs> this is not planning language, this is like what the planning committee citizens were like, let's be clear, this is how we want to get ahead of problems and learn from, learn from the past. So I think, I think we landed in the right spot. Okay, any other comments? No? All those in favor? <laughs> Opposed? No. Carried. Thank you, Mr. Love. Thank you. Forge ahead into backup beepers. Anyone need a break? <laughs> Let's forge ahead. I see Mr. Borsos is already at the microphone, so I right hear. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Good evening. Uh, this evening, I'm here to uh, discuss backup beepers and backup beeper regulations. Uh, so, as a result of a delegation that uh, presentation, uh, uh, pardon me, as a result of a delegation presentation made to council at uh, the May 13th, 2019 council meeting, administration was asked to bring forward a variety of options uh, with the intent to reduce noise. Uh, this was to include uh, requiring equipment to have backup beepers that have. Uh, reduce noise with the newer broadband style of beeper. Additionally, administration to recommend town program options that would assist businesses in easily and cost effectively accessing the specific backup beepers learned about. Uh, so then we brought an update to, to council in July of 2019, and as administration continued to research and view options appropriate for Cochrane. So administration has been reviewing programs that will work in the Cochrane context based on information provided uh, by Mr. Shire, existing Town of Cochrane bylaws and regulations, as well as best practices and experiences from other municipalities. Under previous initiatives dating back to 2016-2017, Town Administration worked concerned residents in researching and supporting changes to replace standard backup beater, beepers utilized by industrial and construction equipment with the newer Bradbond style. Uh, to date, uh, we've had several businesses and town equipment were transitioned to the broadband style of alarms, and considerations were given at that time to the request to implement bylaw provisions in the town, banning all but the broadband style. Uh, so enforcement and some of those restrictions, enforcement of some restrictions on companies coming into the community to 
form work for independent businesses or residents uh, would not be practical given the amount of truck traffic and uh, deliveries that take place involving a global transportation market here in Cochrane. Um, in follow-up to the recent council motion, administration reached out to other municipalities to see if any had such provisions in place at this time. Uh, to date, none have been identified and those mun municipalities been spoken to indicated similar concerns with difficulty in enforcement. A working session was also held with the developer liaison group, uh, complete with the delegation uh, to present uh, the broadband options. And while that group was receptive to the concerns, it was noted that their use of a variety of contractors from across the region would make it difficult to support or implement a requirement of the broadband style, uh, which is not an industry standard at this time. Uh, we also had a during uh, recent noise permit process for a large scale project within a town. Uh, at, during the permit process, municipal enforcement encouraged them to use the ambient backup alarms and they provided some feedback during that process. Uh, although ambient backup alarms were considered for safety purposes, it was determined that conventional backup alarms are the preference for both the industry and the contractor for the type of equipment that will be used on site. Uh, through these conversations with the development industry, community businesses, chamber of commerce and construction industry, while many are sensitive to the reasoning behind the quest, they either do not feel the newer technology is appropriate or their specific company policies and protocols will not currently allow for the change at this time. Uh, those businesses in the community that have trans transitioned over to the ambient style are committed to continuing with those beepers, including when replacing equipment, economic development through the business licensing program will also be continuing to promote the ambient style with direct business contact and business incentives for support and transition. Administration is also committed to uh, continuing to work with the community businesses and encouraging the use of the broadband style backup beepers in our community and on town projects where appropriate. Where appropriate. Uh, consideration could also be given including a preference for the ambient style backup beepers on town uh, of Cochrane Capital project tenders and requests for proposals. This model, this would model the preference for our community and assist in determining the actual impacts to contractors as we work through the inclusion of this preference in a construction project. So uh, administration is currently uh, doing the following. Uh, information is posted on the town's website indicating that the town of Cochrane supports and encourages the use of broadband backup alarms, including in projects undertaken by the town. And economic development will be continuing to promote the ambient style with direct business contacts and business incentives for further support and transition. Me. At this time, uh, administration is uh, recommending option number one that council receive the report for information. Open for any questions. Okay, thank you. Councillor Flowers, I believe you brought this forward. I did after hearing the reports from the community members. Have you had any further contact with the people that brought it forward and the research that they did in the past? Uh, with the delegation? Right. Uh, the delegation has forwarded other information to me, yes, regarding other uh, initiatives and stuff that they found throughout. None of them were local initiatives. They were kind of a global initiative that they came across and the information that they sent. Have you, did you include them in the developer liaison group? Meeting? Yes, they were there. They were present and they actually did a presentation, I believe. Yeah. The same presentation okay. that they give to council, correct? Mr. Shire was there with his beepers and, yeah. and the other style as well. Well, I would like to move option three to accept this report as information and provide further direction. Um, further to that, I move that administration create a noise bylaw that incorporates the standards developed by the Noise Abatement Society of the United Kingdom, which was forwarded to us by the community members who have done the research. This would apply to all equipment operating within the town of Cochrane and would be brought back to council by January 2020. And the reason that I am putting that forward is I really feel disappointed that there wasn't much new information. Everything that we heard tonight, we've heard before. And we've had since May to look into this. And we were, um, the motion asked for options for us to consider. 
as well as programs to make it work for businesses, and we did not receive that. And no further contact that I understood was happening with the community residents. We have a fast growing community with many large projects underway. Over the next five years, it's gonna be incredible. This is an opportunity to get ahead of the noise problems that will exist. We have proven that the new broadband style backup beepers work through our own town vehicles. We have heard that they've been proven to be safe and now we need to get going on the next step to have others follow us. Enforcement can be carried out with the education and a sound meter. If we don't have any rules in place, then there's nothing we can do when the complaints come in. I believe there are many problems that Cochrane residents experience due to our fast growth. This is one area that we can control, so let's make a difference here and be proactive. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Flowers. Councillor McFadden. Um, yeah, I have to agree with Councillor Flowers. I was disappointed as well. I thought Council was fairly clear that we were looking for some solutions. Um, and uh, having uh, represented and lived in communities that have been affected by backup beepers for their quality of life, I've lived in the East End and in Riverview, uh, both heavily affected by backup beepers um, from some of uh, Spray Lakes and Allspan. Um, and it was a major issue um, for those residents in particular. Uh, those companies have been great community leaders and partners and have worked uh, with the group and put the Zambient uh, beepers in place. And as a resident of Riverview, um, you know, backup beepers, it's not a problem. It's not a problem in the East End that I'm hearing from anymore. So we've solved it. So I would hate to take and throw away all that great work and to allow all the new development coming in um, to cause problems for us. I mean, and Councillor Flowers has raised it. I mean, we're gonna have, it's gonna be a busy place one way or the other. Um, 22 and 1A is gonna be upgraded with all the infrastructure that comes with that. Uh, the Greystone development is going to be underway and um, my particular, I've already noticed backup beavers from that equipment and we were trying to get ahead of that problem with this motion. Um, with all the work we're doing in center, that's going to impact the uh, folks in the East End more. Yeah? RCMP yeah, and the RCMP barracks. So it's, this is a, a problem I know is coming down the pipe, and I think what we need to do, and what we're, we're trying to do, is get in front of it and make sure that we're, we're using the solutions we have. Um, Allspan, Spray Lakes, and the town, we're all using these technologies, I think, between those three are probably some of the biggest employers in town with the largest machineries in town. And um, we've worked together to solve this problem. So to allow new construction to set us back um, is really only gonna love it. You raise my tension like a backup beeper does. Um, so I, I am disappointed that the report has landed in a do nothing state and that it has um, uh, allows to commit to continue the ambient alarms when I think that's where we should be going. So I can certainly support, I think where Councillor Flowers is going is that, you know, we receive your report for information, but I would like something brought back to mandate change so that we get ahead of these problems. Councillor Padeco, did you have your light on? It's, it's on. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I just have one question. When it comes to the enforcement side of things, what, what, are, you, what are you kind of figuring um, you know, if, if this does go through, you know, how, how do we try to enforce it? And I mean, what kind of dollar amount might be attached to that? I mean, does that maybe require like three more members or two more members or do you have any guess, I guess? Well, it'd be hard to say what a financial implication would be to enforce it, uh, I guess, until something happened. But uh, the enforcement side of it would be difficult to begin with. Uh, so, for example, noise is... Um, one of those things that is a difficult uh, subject matter to, to enforce and it's uh, other communities that I reached out to don't have anything in a bylaw. Uh, other communities and research that I read or things that Mr. Shire even presented are doing what our community is doing already. Trying to be good neighbors and trying to be community partners. So we had Allspan and we have Spray Lakes and most uh, businesses that have been mentioned already that took that step, us as the town, changing to the ambient alarms. And those are things that we're continuing to work with through economic development, ensuring that those community partners are still doing and that we're taking all stakeholders into consideration. 
That's why we spoke to the development liaison groups and that's why we spoke to the businesses and that's why we continue to speak. I followed up with economic development and what they would do again, following up with the businesses that are doing those things. So. Yeah, and I just, I think it, it's gonna open up a whole broader discussion. Um, you know, you've got motorcycles, you've got vehicles, mm -hmm. I, I mean, and I, I just, I think going down that road, it's going to be tough. And I mean, how do you enforce all those things all at once, unless we've got like a whole troop of people out there ticketing stuff? I think it's, um, I think it's going to be tough. And and I agree. I mean, does it mean that you do nothing? I don't know. I just don't know if taking a hard no stance on this is necessarily the way to go either, because again, it's going to snowball into all those other areas that I don't, uh, I don't necessarily want to go down that path either. So, Councillor Nagel. Um, I definitely appreciate the need for something to be done about the backup alarms. I just would like uh, some clarification on Councillor Flowers' motion. If this is passed, would we then get something to come back from administration for future consideration? Is that what we would be voting on right now? Can you read your motion again? Because <laughs> I had the same question. That was my intention, that it would come back to us by January. But um, you have a look. And I also have another question I can ask while uh, Councillor Flowers bring that up. Uh, would we actually have the authority to require private contractors and construction companies to do certain things with their backup alarms? Like, I think that's all under provincial regulation, is well, it not? Well, the backup beepers are part of, you're right, provincial legislation through occupational health and safety. So that's the requirement on why they need the beepers on the vehicles that they do. So we are bridging that legislation. And w would we be allowed to make some sort of requirement or would it be something we can approach through the back end of uh, our public RFPs or? And that was one of the, uh, pardon me, I'll go back to my report here. So I guess maybe the easiest way is, so mentioned in the report in that option two, uh, that council received the report for information and direct administration to include the preference for broadband uh, style backup beepers to be included in all future capital project mm -hmm. tenders and requests for proposals. Okay. If I could, if I could provide some additional oh, sorry, information. Yes. Um, the occupy when we when we were researching the options of pro completely prohibiting all back all backup beepers other than the broadband style. It was through review of the legislation, the Occupational Health and Safety Act, there's nothing in there that precludes companies from implementing the broadband beepers, provided that it is complies with their in individual business occupational health and safety programs. If their individual health and safety programs do not, do not allow for that, then we could be treading into a difficult area to enforce. That was why the specific um, discussion happened about the major project that is currently ongoing in our community and the inclusion of broadband beepers for that equipment. And that company refused to do it because it was not in accordance with their occupational health and safety program. Yeah, and, and for me, it's not just a matter of whether or not we can enforce it. It's like whether or not we have the right to tell companies how to control their equipment. But yeah, I could. I, that's it for my questions, but I did my, back to my first question. Can you please reread okay. your? <laughs> um, then I move that administration create a noise bylaw that incorporates the standards developed by the Noise Abatement Society of the United Kingdom, which was forwarded to us by the community members who have done the research. This would apply to all equipment operating within the town of Cochrane and would be brought back to council by January 2020. Did you include in there anywhere, I, I think we all received an email from them, that there was one statement that was uh, site specific variances will be considered on a case by case basis. Okay. Councillor Reed. Yeah. Um, you know, in the two years that we've been together as a council, I don't know that I've ever seen Council Flowers be so passionate about something as important as this, in particular in her own motion. So <clears throat> on the merit of it, that aside, I, uh, even on the merit of it, I think it's important. I guess my concern is, and maybe there's some, you know, kind of mediated way of being able to do that, but 
you know, perhaps anybody that the town would have business with. So, for example, if we're constructing a new RCMP barracks, and that's our responsibility, that we would, as part of that contract, require that. I think through the Developers Association or whatever that group is, perhaps there's something we could do with that group and working with them. But like Councillor Fideco, I'm concerned about, you know, what about the delivery guy that comes in from Home Depot from the city and has to back into your driveway? How do we, how do we monitor and how do we enforce that? So I, for me, I think, <clears throat> well, I want to be supportive of it. I think that there, you know, there's got to be some kind of in-between that we could kind of work this through. It's option two. Yeah. Councillor McFadden. So, well, I, I like option two in that it receives the report for information and then um, it requires the backup beepers for all capital project tenders. So that's anything that we're going to pay for, we're going to require that those companies providing that service have that technology or some form of quiet backup beepers. So that, that kind of covers directly what we can cover, but um, I wonder if we could then add additionally, because the trick is that we also want businesses coming to town, businesses to operate in town to also be required to do this. I think you could probably tie it to the business license that if you're gonna have a business license in Cochrane, so if you're gonna operate a business in Cochrane in any form, you have to have a business license with us. And I think you could link it to the business license. Um, but I don't actually know that for sure. So I was wondering then if maybe the motion could be motion two, but amended to say, um, and further to report back on how the broadband backup beepers be required more broadly. And I think administratively, we understand what we're looking for. But, and I appreciate um, the public feedback we'd had on this mm -hmm. and where Councillor Flowers is trying to go to like give some strong direction. So I, I'd like to take option two, just take it a little bit further because I really think there is a way to more strongly encourage those who are going to be doing business in Cochrane to do it on terms that's not gonna drive our residents crazy. So you're amending the motion? I think we'd be defeating the motion. It's actually a different. It's a different, it's yeah. a different one entirely. Okay. I think we can land where Councilor so Flowers have to wants to with option the two. The motion, or you rescind it, or. Do you want me to email what I'm thinking? Because uh, before you go on, I, I kind of I feel the same way. I I want to do something. I wrote, had notes in my own. Well, <laughs> let's not go there. Uh, this white pencil does not write on paper. Um, about us not going enough, not going far enough, not being, we're trying to be an innovative community, uh, coming up with innovative solutions to problems, and I hear that we don't have one, and I understand, uh, and I think we need <coughs> to strike a balance here. Administration is busy doing our priority list. This is something out of, uh, a little bit out of left field that we're asking uh, for time. I would like to see that January be, you know, extended. Uh, we're we're right in the middle of budget season coming up. It's going to be uh, an insane amount of work mm -hmm. to get us through to the end of the year. Um, but I like option two. We have our own facilities that we're building uh, and projects that we have direct control over. And if that is in the RFP, if somebody wants to be awarded that contract, they'll put a $50 beeper on their, or non-beeper, one, one of those. Uh, on their equipment, but I do like what Councillor McFadden's saying, and I don't think we need to go back and do a whole fulsome search. But what are what are the options? Like, I think we just have another kick at this. So maybe we should just send it back with the direction that we've already talked about tonight um, for more input from administration. So it doesn't die, is what I'm saying but I'll put that out there. Councillor Flowers. I will rescind my motion. Look for another motion. Okay. Motion rescinded. Mr. Devana. So I like option two, and you can add on, you know, something to the fact that in administration we're looking to broaden the application of the ambient beepers, and we'll come back to you with that. It could be business licenses, it could be a number of things, but you give us that direction, then we'll do that work. Okay, and I think that's the intent you were looking for, Councillor McFadden. Do you want to make that motion? Yep. So I will do option two as read with the addition of 
and further to report back to Council on how the broadband backup beepers can be required more broadly. Okay. Uh, no, in January of 2020. <laughs> uh, I think January was good. Is January okay? I don't think it's okay. Spring? March 2020. Okay. Everybody understands what we're doing? Any comments, questions, concerns? All those in favor? It's carried. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I get to go to the boring part. Should we take a two minute break before you come up? She's sprinting. <laughs> Two-minute break. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm.
All right, let's do this. All right. 6E. Fortis Alberta Electric Distribution System Franchise Fee. Take it away. Thank you. Uh, good, good evening, evening. Mayor Janung and members of Council. I'm before you this evening as a follow-up to a last Council meeting on October the 15th, where I proposed an increase to the Fortis franchise fees from the current 15% rate to the 17% rate. Uh, the process for that is to advertise for two weeks, which we did on October the 17th and the 24th, uh, asking for public feedback and then bringing this back to you tonight for consideration. Uh, I did receive one comment from a taxpayer and to just sort of summarize, um, this resident was concerned that the, we were trying to hide increased costs where it should be covered by taxes, we were trying to hide it in a, the Fortis franchise fees, and they were concerned that the fees would be paying for transit and felt that transit should be paid for through taxes. And that was the only comment that I had received from anyone. Um, so, given that, I'm before you this evening seeking your approval for me to proceed with um, notifying Forrest that we'd like to increase our franchise fee rate from 15% to 17% effective January 1st of 2020. And I welcome any questions. The first one I have is, is this going to be used to offset the cost of transit and no. hiding that cost? No. Okay. Thank you. I say that tongue in cheek, but it's, it was no. a, a real question. Uh, Councilor Reed. So I will move uh, option one that council uh, directs administration notify f whatever else it says. I guess. Fortis, yeah. Yeah. My question really was, does it have to be presented this way? Because I mean, essentially, what people I think, or what I understood at least one person to be confused about was that we were asking for a 17 percent increase, when in reality it's only a two percent. Correct. It has to be presented because council has to specify what okay. the rate will be. Okay, and then the second one was, and actually the mayor had kind of picked up on it, when in the, um, the prefix it talks about the fee being used for transportation. What exactly would it be used for if it's not being used for transit when it says uh, funding transportation operating requirements? That would be the roads department. Okay, perfect. <laughs> yeah, and I think, again, you know, maybe in terms of being able to move forward, it, it either, you know, something in the background that identifies that more specifically, I mean, I understand from an accounting perspective that transportation is probably the funding or the line your line item you're using. But if it were clear, I think it would it would help in terms of the press and and the community as a whole. So just a comment. Thank you, Councillor Fideko. I agree with Councillor Reed. I think that even for myself, even if it goes into the roads department, like what what is what are they using it for, right? Like I think that again goes back to the community to say, hey, you know what, you're. We're going to raise this, but exactly where does it go? What's it being used towards? People become less frustrated if they know where their money is being spent. But even if we say transportation roads, well, I mean, is that paint for the roads? Is it equipment for the roads? Like, is it workers for the roads? Like, what actually is it going to? It's for snow removal, for sand and salting, for line marking, for paving and patching, and all of the services that are provided by our roads operations, with the exception of transit, because transit is a separate department. Perfect, and I agree. That is the information that should be presented with it so that then I think that not only can we make a logical decision, but we can present it better out to the community, in my opinion. Okay, thank you. Councillor Nagel? Um, I did not receive very good feedback about this change. As everybody else has mentioned, people feel, um, some people feel anyways, that we're just trying to do this as a one-off tax hike. Um, is there any way we could defer this conversation for a couple weeks and make this decision as part of our overall budget discussion so we figure out exactly how much revenue we are going to need for the next few years and where we want that revenue to come from? Or does this need to be decided this evening? If we don't decide this evening, then we can't make the change effective January 1st uh, for 2020. Uh, and then I'd have to check with Fortis to see if there was an option to have it come in some other time of the year in 2020. Uh, but they do need notification by November 1st. Um, and, I mean, could we defer it till after the draft 2020 budget presentation, which is the next item on the agenda? Um, I just, like, I, I would like a bit of an explanation as to um, do we need this revenue increase? Is that something that has been planned in the, in the budget? And yes. To be honest, I have not read through the draft 
the draft budget yet. We don't have it yet. Right. 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 <laughs> so you don't have it yet, and yes, it is included in the proposed uh, 2020 budget. Uh, and the proposed 2020 budget is looking at a 2.95% tax increase net of growth and growth at 2.25%. Uh, if this d does not in, uh, go through with the Fortis franchise fees, because we've included the $301,000 in the proposed budget, then you would be looking at a, just a over 1% more in taxes, uh, probably about 1.2% more uh, tax increase to make up for that 301000 so I, I guess like because this is coming tonight with the draft budget, it is part of our overall budget discussion. And I, I know people are unhappy about it, but for me, I do try to favor user fees over flat tax rates. So I, I suppose I, I guess I'll support this this evening, but then also be looking for cost savings during our budget discussion. And for me, they are one conversation, even though it's two budget items. That's the way I'm looking at it. But yeah. Okay. Councillor Wilson. Uh, I'm very much of the same mindset as Councillor Nagel. I, I thought the, question, the resident question was a good one that I don't know the answer to. Why would we do this rather than just, um, what, what's the advantage of the Fortis franchise fee versus just adding municipal tax increase? We can certainly do that, uh, but I also know that Council has provided feedback previously that you would like to minimize the tax increase. Uh, and also from our customer satisfaction survey, we had heard that people felt they got value for their user fees. Uh, and that so from that, it appeared that perhaps user fees might be a way to balance out a tax increase rather than it all falling as a property tax increase to put some of it as a user fee increase. It's, it's just optics so either way, it's going to affect every the same people the same amount, whether it was a franchise fee increase and it comes out of the utility bill or if it's a property tax increase is there I'm, I'm trying to think is there any difference between the people paying I don't think there is I think so it's based on you can correct me if I'm wrong the kilowatt hours so the amount of energy that you would use your franchise fee would be greater is that correct, correct? yes so it's okay. a user pay model right so if you actually cut back on your electricity you right. would pay less franchise fee so there is a ability for people to I mean use less power, pay less franchise fee, use more power, pay more. The balance of that is 301,000. Correct. Thank you, that was, that was exactly what I was looking for. And I, I then completely agree with Councillor Nagel's point that um, I would support this and be looking to save on the other side then. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Devaney, you had something to add? Uh, I guess, you know, uh, these t companies use our right-of-ways and, you know, and, and cause some damage which they have to repair but it's still the road is never the same as it was when they started with their uh, improvement and so th these fees are specifically designed so that we can recover that money to update our road network that's why we we collect them in the first place and it is a completely user pay system and it's not the same as property taxes because property taxes are only paid by property owners they're not paid by all citizens, you know, but utilities, everybody uses those. That's another good point, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? No? So we're voting to increase the franchise fee. Uh, all those in favor? It's carried. Thank you. Next item. The budget. I thought you were going to have some sort of music or some, you know. Ta -da. No. <laughs> okay, I'm going to steal a little bit of your thunder. Oh. Uh, <laughs> assuming you're going 15 minutes long, more than 15 minutes, I would need a motion to go past 10 p.m. Because it's the budget and it's an important document to every resident in the community, I feel that we should give it the time it allots. So, <laughs> all those in favor? Carried. Thank you. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. Now I don't have to worry about that while I'm listening to you. <laughs> All right. Good evening. I'm before you tonight to present to you the draft 2020 to 2022 budget as put together and proposed by administration. So the proposed budget uh, actually delivers on our community feedback and council strategic priorities that we've been hearing uh, as we've been working our way through council's visioning and strategic priorities. It invests in our infrastructure uh, required for our community, which as you know is growing, uh, and it makes sure that we continue to provide the excellent services that we have to this point, and all at what we feel is a sustainable tax increase. So as you've probably seen this before, we have the budget process. The process didn't change this year. Uh, we've made our way through steps one through five, and now we're in the six, seven, eight, and nine. So six is we provide you with a draft budget. Then we move into budget deliberations, and then we move to hopefully uh, the first council meeting in December that we pass a 2020 to 2022 operating and capital budgets. So our budgets do include meeting council strategic priorities, of which there are four of them, and our proposed budget delivers on all four of those priorities, and originally had a whole list of stuff, but once you get the budget uh, book, you will see that we have actually provided you with lists under each of your council priorities that will show you how it is we're going to be meeting those throughout that plan. Uh, things to note in the 2020 operating budget from when we first put 2020 together the last time when we put our three-year plan together uh, We noted that there's been a slow up in growth and that slowness in growth has actually impacted the revenues in many departments uh, Assessment taxation planning services safety code civil land development and the utility departments so administration did take into consideration that we've gone from a 4% anticipated growth to a 2.25 anticipated growth in 2020. So therefore we've reduced revenues, non-tax revenues, but we've also reduced expenditures based on the slowing of growth. Uh, also of note, council has brought in reserve contributions to the infrastructure gap reserve. The idea was to increase it by 2% per year. Given the slowing of growth, administration has modified that increase to $500,000 a year per year through 2020, 21, and 22. Also, just to remind Council that 2020 budget is also including the first full year of the operating costs of the transit. And so that is included for taxpayer dollars as well as user fees from those who ride the Colt service. So, just to give you sort of a little bit of a snapshot, so here's a breakdown of the 2020 revenue sources. Uh, user fees, reserve draws, franchise fees, government contributions, fines, penalties, etc., as well as the municipal tax dollars. So as you can see, just under half of the total revenue collected for the town of Cochrane to provide your services comes from the tax dollars. The other more than half comes from those various other sources. So now that's where it comes from, but where does it go? So this is an overview pie chart that sort of breaks it down into what are the different areas where those dollars are going to be put to work. So we have community safety, we have transit, community services, uh, community partners, uh, general and corporate services, council, and as you can see, council is only 1% of the pie, uh, but does the very important work. Thanks so that just kind of gives you a bit of a breakdown. And these part charts will, will be included in some advertising we plan to put out uh, so that the public will have access to these pie charts as well. So what are the proposed tax increases over the three-year period? So if you look at the gross tax increase, it's 5.2, 5.75, and 5.5. If you take off growth, the assumption is the growth for, this, or for coming year 2020 is 2.25, rising to 3 and 3. So that's still well under the 4% that we were originally budgeting. So you take that off of those gross numbers and we end up with net tax increase of 2.95 proposed for 2020, 2.75 in 21 and 2.5 in 2020. So as you can see, the net tax increase is going down over that three year period rather than going up. Um, we did take into consideration um, that growth decrease and also that 1% represents two, uh, just over $275,000 in initial, additional property tax revenue. So what's the impact on the average home in Cochrane? 
So in 2019, uh, the average single family dwelling was assessed at $479,900, and they would have paid $2,251 in municipal taxes. That was a $60 a year increase over the 2018, which was a $5 per month increase. Looking at 2020, 21, and 22, we're looking at a $66, $64, and $59 increase. And that ties in with the decreasing percentage increase that I showed in previous slides. So the monthly cost would be $5.50 more in 2020, $5.31 in 21, and $4.92 in 2022. Part of the work that we do requires staff, uh, and so the 2020 proposed staffing increases is an equivalent of 4.87 full-time equivalent positions uh, and increased hours, and that is all funded through the growth, that 2.25%, as well as 0.73 FTE increased hours for utilities that are funded by the utility rates. So that includes an asset management coordinator to begin the work that's one of council's priorities to bring all the master plans we have all over the place and bring them together so we can get one cohesive strategic plan for asset management and determining reserve contributions and doing our capital budgeting. The network security administration is a administrator is a position that council had approved at the adjustments for infrastructure information services in 2019 and that position would continue into 2020. Transportation engineer would be offset by a reduction in our contract services, which we currently hire out an engineering firm to do. A customer service representative, right now there's casual and part-time hours for our customer service representatives. This would be changing those part-time and casual hours into two full-time positions. There's summer program leader, which is a seasonal position, a grant supported energy manager, casual facility workers positions in the form of increased hours, as well as the casual cleaners and increased hours in theirs. For the utility departments, the staff proposed staffing changes for 2020 include a water systems technologist, an admin assistant waste recycling and environmental educator, and all of those are increased hours. So those are existing positions, and we're just looking for those to have an increase in hours. One of the things I did want to talk to you about was some of the efficiencies in the red tape reduction initiatives that administration has already undertaken. Uh, these do factor into the budgets and I also know that finding efficiencies was one of council's priorities and so I wanted to bring to you some of the things that staff has already been doing and we will continue to do even more. So I've broken it down into use of technology is the first thing so some I'm not going to read them all to you because this uh, presentation will be posted on our website as well so you can always refer back to that um, but we've been doing some automation of operating controls uh, GPS tracking the use of our GIS uh, digital permit tracking a whole bunch of other improvements in the information services area that you heard a little bit about um, from our information services manager and we've been trying to use more and more of our electronic processing systems, ways that we can, we can utilize technology to do a lot of the heavy lifting or more of the heavy lifting for us. Another big thing that is the most recent thing that you will benefit from when you see the budget book tonight is we implemented the use of a budgeting software called Questica and, the, and rather than using Word documents and Excel spreadsheets and trying to deal with version control and trying to amalgamate everything, uh, it, we had one stop shopping so all of the information was fed into the software and then we used the information in the software to produce the budget book which saved many, many hours. Another thing we've been using to try and find efficiencies in reducing red tape is through online solutions. So trying to increase our online self-serve options for people who need to do business with the town, uh, using fillable PDFs, uh, making sure, trying to increase e-billing rather than mailing snail mail bills, pay, printing them out on paper. Uh, trying to do online payments, uh, get people signed up for that, trying to use online booking systems and things like that. So wherever there's opportunity to use online and do self-serve, uh, that increases the efficiency and actually improves customer service, not taking away the human being. If you still prefer to do your business speaking to someone, that is still very much option that's available. The other thing we've been looking through is trying to find efficiencies of red tape reductions through cost and time savings. 
So things like uh, the Eco Centre has purchased their own wood chipper, so they chip their own woods instead of shipping it off to the city to be chipped, and then selling those wood chips for use by locals uh, in their landscaping initiatives, uh, which then generates some revenue. Uh, we're also looking at changing some contracts, bringing investigations for HR in-house rather than uh, paying for contractors to do that. We've been modifying staffing schedules to reduce overtime hours, so rather than having someone working Monday to Friday, 9 to 5, looking at, no, maybe no, you need to work Tuesday to through Saturday, so we have the coverage without having any overtime. We've been looking at leasing vehicles and using leased vehicles for seasonal workers rather than owning them year-round. Uh, and then trying to make sure that we're cognizant of where capital projects are, what can we do to combine them so that there's only one mobilization cost, one tearing up of the area. Uh, and also looking at our power consumption, as well as the contracts. We renegotiated our power and natural gas contracts, and those have come in at a far lower price. We've, finally, we've looked at how can we find efficiencies through collaboration? So looking at partnerships with other areas, in particular there's one with uh, United Way. Uh, the ranch house is actually working so that people are now booking their catering services directly with the caterer rather than through the ranch house. Uh, trying to use a planner on call schedule so that it's more efficient, not every planner's having to come to the desk throughout the day. There's an assigned planner so that they can focus on that and everyone else can focus on the other work. We're using customer surveys and the results of that to try and improve our services. And we're trying to look at uh, yeah, alternative forms of performance uh, comparable to other municipalities. How can we look at our performance securities? That's the security bonds when people are needed to leave a bond with us to promise that they'll do the work. How is it we can be more comparable to other municipalities and reduce some of the red tape around that? And we also have instituted a system where safety codes is checking to make sure that a business looking for a safety code permit actually has a business license. So there's a system in place that that gets checked so then we can make sure that those are both happening at the same time and it's actually increased our business licensing compliance. So those are the, just some examples of things we've already done. So that sort of deals a bit with the operating component of the budget, uh, but as you know, the bigger dollar numbers are usually the capital budgets. So to tell you a little bit about the capital budgets that are proposed for 2020 through 2022, uh, there's that infrastructure gap reserve, so I talked to you about increasing that by $500,000 a year rather than the 2% we originally had anticipated. Uh, in 2019, Council approved the transfer of 2.27% of property taxes, or just over $600,000 to the infrastructure gap reserve. And then the chart on this slide shows you what the proposed budget includes for that transfer to the infrastructure gap. Uh, so we're moving from a 2.27% of property tax, slowly up to 6.58% by we get time we get to 2022. So that isn't quite the 2% per year, but... Um, capital plan highlights. So the draft budget actually includes $40.1 million in capital projects just in 2020 alone. Uh, 2020 is one of the larger capital project years uh, and later on I'll show you a, a slide that sort of breaks down what our capital expenditures by year are and you can see that we have three years in particular that spike in the dollar total for capital projects, 2020 being one of them. So included in the 2020 budget is the transit hub and innovation outpost work, railway street west infrastructure upgrades, that's in preparation for work on uh, the transit hub, uh, center avenue widening design, a downtown pedestrian crossing at grade, the new protective services building, uh, Horse Creek Sports Park servicing, that's getting utilities in there, and continue to try and complete the Jack Tennant Bridge and the connections. There are, and this year you will find that in the budget document, there are way more details on each of the capital projects that are being proposed than you've seen in the past. Uh, and I think you might uh, like what we're proposing and that we have included in the budget document. So here's the slide I was telling you about of capital expenditures. So as you can see, we have three spike years, 2020, 23, and 29. So what are some of the things that are causing those spikes? Uh, for 2020, as I said, RCMP and the Transit Hub and the Innovation Outpost. Uh, for 2023, it's uh, mostly the Highway 1A, 5th to Centre, D 
dealing with that, as well as a solar project, water capacity projects, as well as starting to maybe do some work on the Horse Creek Sports Park, actually developing items in that park. Uh, we also have a bit of a spike in 2025. That includes mostly, that's when we start doing the wastewater pipeline twinning to Calgary. Uh, and then in 2029, the big spike is a, more of the pipeline twinning, uh, as well as James Walker Trail connection to South Bow. So those are the causes of those spikes. So that's what sort of the 10-year financial plan looks like, and that 10-year financial plan is also included in the budget. So looking at the 10-year plan, uh, what, what impact does that have on our reserves? So I prepared this graphic to show you uh, where we start out with our reserve balances in 2019. And this takes into consideration the budgeted reserve contributions, including the contribution to the infrastructure gap reserve. So the orange, which is the bottom one, is our balances of our capital reserves. The gray is the offsite levy reserves. The yellow is the CRL, or Community Revitalization Levy Reserve, and the blue is our operating reserves. So as Ms. Guida had mentioned earlier, our operating reserves, as you can see, stay fairly stable over that 10-year period of time. The same cannot be said for our capital reserves. So all that to say that we, as those spikes are showing, uh, we'll need to do a bit of work on our 10-year financial plan uh, and see what we can do about evening out some of those spikes. <laughs> Uh, also taking the 10-year that's in the draft budget, doing debt projections. So this assumes that our debt limit will increase by 3% per year. Our debt limit's calculated on our non-grant revenue each year, so I feel that a 3% increase is reasonable. We don't have an increase in user fees and taxes and uh, rental income. Uh, so. Projecting that out, the top line is what percentage of the debt limit that council has set would we use at each of those points over the next 10 years. So we go from 29% in 2019 to 64% in 2029. And council has set the debt limit for the town of Cochrane that council's com more comfortable with at 80% of the Municipal Government Act debt limit calculation. So that's the blue line. So if you're determining what our debt limits, or our debt usage would be by the time you get to 2029, it would be 51% if you're looking at the MGA debt limit, 64% if you're looking at council set limit. However, to point out that very light bottom line at the bottom is the percentage of the debt that's tax supported. So as you can see, the majority of the debt is either comes from user fees or offsite levies. Not very much of it relatively speaking, is coming from tax support. Uh, and actually the line stays fairly consistent across that period of time. There aren't a lot of spikes in the tax supported debt. So where do we go from here? Uh, once council meeting is finished this evening, we have hard copies available for council. The budget document will also be posted online tomorrow, uh, as well as we will be inviting online feedback, there will be a form on letstalkcochrane.ca slash budget. Uh, that feedback period will be from October 29th to November the 13th. From on November the 2nd and November the 5th, administration is proposing a couple of pop-up sessions to be held at the Spray Lakes Recreation Center uh, to do some public engagement to get some feedback from the public and to provide them more information or answer questions that they might have on the budget. We would take the feedback back that we get at those two sessions and bring them to the council deliberation sessions, which we're proposing to have on November the 18th and 19th, which is a Monday and Tuesday. And then, depending on how things go, hopefully we can bring back a budget for council consideration and adoption at the December 9th meeting. Uh, that concludes my presentation, and I would welcome any questions that you have. Okay, given the fact that we'll be debating it yes. in the near future. Uh, Councillor Nagel. Thanks very much for your very thorough presentation. I'm looking forward to reading the budget. Mm -hmm. um, a couple questions. I'm wondering if you know how the uh, recent announcements about MSI funding will affect our future budgets and uh, our 10-year capital strategy. Have you had time to go through that or have you just been too focused on the uh, immediate short-term budgeting? 
Uh, so given that the province just made that announcement late Thursday afternoon, no, uh, <laughs> the uh, draft budget that administration is proposing does not take that into consideration. Uh, my understanding is there's debate on what MSI is going to look like past 2021 and so that would have to be a discussion when we start looking at our 10 year financial plan that I'd said we're going to have to take a look at things. Okay, and then my, my second question. Um, first off, I was very impressed by the long list of operational improvements you guys are looking at implementing. I'm just wondering what kind of a process uh, everybody went through to come up with all those uh, good ideas. Well, uh, to be honest, I sent an email out to all the managers and I asked them to provide me with all of the efficiencies that they've implemented and the red tape reductions, and that's trying to narrow that all down from many, many emails. Perfect, great work, thanks. I guess, do I need to remove the recommended action? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I shall do that. Okay. Mr. Wilson. Uh, I'll be really quick. Uh, two of my things just got ticked off the list there. I just, uh, my compliments. I also really appreciated the efficiency gains listed there. Um, it's a council priority and the fact that we're talking about it right now is a big win and I appreciate that. Um, I, I really appreciated the flexibility on the capital reserve. I think that's, um, I would have argued for that given the slowed growth rate and I think that was the right thing to do. And the increased detail on the capital project list which is uh, large, important and growing. I'm uh, a big fan of that too. So just all in all, well done. Great Thank you. presentation. Thank you. Councilor Reed. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, I was really impressed. That was a great presentation. Uh, a lot of information. I'm really looking forward to, to looking into the budget in more detail. Um, Given the slow growth, you commented it was that uh, about reducing expenditures for the coming year. Um, and I'm assuming that in the budget we'll see where those are and how that's going to occur. I'm assuming that's beyond the efficiencies that you've already identified. Is that correct? Yeah, in the current budget book, uh, there isn't any page that will immediately point that out to you where we've made a reduction from the previous year. Uh, but certainly if that would be information that council would like during the deliberations, we can do that. But I can give you just sort of a quick thing that I did write down, um, if it would be helpful to you. Um, I have, where is it? Oh, I had it. <laughs> uh, I was anticipating that question and I had written it down and I just have to find where I put it. I don't have that, so I will get that together. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I had two others if I could. Um, in the listing of the new positions you had set offset, does that mean that they're fully offset or partly offset? No, they're fully offset. Fully offset, okay. Um, I was wondering in, under the partnering, do we, is there anything provincially done like through AMA in terms of uh, group purchases or sourcing that we do with other communities? I know this has nothing to do with your budget mm -hmm. presentation, but it came up as a uh, something I was thinking about. Does that ever occur? There might be in some departments. Um, I don't know if Ms. Lowe might have information on the fire service if you sort of coordinate with other fire services or, um, but nothing comes to the top of mind. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the last question I had was, protective services, is, is that is indicated a new building? Would they not be part of the RCMP new building? That is the RCMP new detachment, okay. yeah. Perfect. It's called protective services that we're Correct, that because it won't okay. just be the RCMP that are located in there, it'd also be municipal enforcement. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, no other questions? No? Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Very thorough. I, uh, obviously this is the biggest, uh, well maybe not the biggest, but it's one of the biggest documents that administration puts together. I've witnessed uh, from my portal in the hallway, uh, the amount of work and effort that has gone into uh, this document tonight. So uh, thank you for that. And I also understand that you were pretty instrumental in the bringing Questica to Cochrane. Um, and thank you for that as well. And Mr. Devana had shared with me all the hours that were saved in that and you referenced it in your report. But uh, I, I'm looking forward to reading it. I won't go on. The hour is getting late. May thank I you. take this opportunity to thank um, all of the team who spent all of the hours putting this together. Mm -hmm. It wasn't any one person and it was a lot of people who put a lot of work into this. So thank you.
Yeah, well said. Thanks. So is there like some ceremonial handoff or do we just get one on the way out? Would you like people to listen to you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then we'll yeah, wait we'll, until after. Good point. We'll, we'll get them on the way out. Thank you. So Thank you. Uh, call the question on uh, receive for information. All those in favor? Carried. Thank you. Uh, notices of motion. Gone. Uh, Mayor's report. Um, it's 10. 10. I think I've pretty much kept to everybody up to date on everything that I've been working on other than uh, while well, you touched on the provincial budget we can talk about that during our budget deliberation so I'll pass on my mayor's report tonight anyone else have a report they want to pass on <laughs> no okay um, oh we have to go in camera yeah yeah okay uh, motion to go in camera, please. Okay, all those in favor? It's carried. Thank you. Just waiting to go back online. We're live, we're streaming, we're waiting for that. Are you going to do it? Okay. okay. All right, we're back out of camera. Uh, Councillor Nagel, you have a motion? Uh, I move the council ratify the IAFF collective agreement for the period of December 31st, 2017 to December 31st, 2021 between the Town of Cochrane and the International Association of Firefighters Local 4819. Okay. All those in favor of that motion? It's carried unanimously. Thank you. The meeting is terminated. Turn over the